District 9 City Councilor. Today is Monday, May 14th. We are here with our good friends from the Boston Center for Youth and Families. Uh, I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing. It is being broadcast and recorded on RCN 82, Comcast Channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. At the conclusion of the department's presentation and questions from my colleagues, we'll take public testimony. Uh, there are sign-in sheets to my left by the door. I ask that you state your name, affiliation, residence, and, and please check the box if you do wish to testify. Uh, I'd like to remind folks that there are several ways uh, to testify publicly. Uh, you can come to one of our hearings, or uh, you can also uh, email us at ccc.wm at boston.gov or also send us uh, snail mail at Boston City Hall, 1 City Hall Plaza, Boston Mass, 02201, Care of Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we are here to review the FY19 BCYF budget as they pertain to dockets 0 559 through 0563. Orders for the FY19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriations for the school department, appropriation for other post employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements as well as dockets 0564 through 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase uh, agreements. Um, in order of their arrival, I, I am joined by uh, District City Councilor Lydia Edwards and Kim Janey to my right and to my left. Um, we have District City Councilors Tim McCarthy and Matt O'Malley. I did shower today. But uh, so with that, I would like to hand it over to Will Morales from uh, the Boston Centers for Youth and Families. Thank you. And your team in the gallery, too. Thank, Thank you, Councilor uh, Siomo and uh, the rest of the council that, that are present here today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to present BCYF's FY19 budget. I'd like to introduce uh, the BCYF staff who have joined me on the floor here today. Christopher Viner, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Programs, and Michael Suprizio, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Administration and Finance. I also like to welcome uh, and thank uh, Marty Martinez, our new Chief of Health and Human Services, who is here sitting on the gallows and supporting us here today. Uh, we also have a number of BCYF staff that's also in the gallery, so thank you, team, for being here with me too as well. I am honored to be here before you as the Commissioner of BCYF. I want to thank Mayor Walsh for his confidence in me and for his support of BCYF and the important work that we do. In your packet, you will have documents that outline our FY18 accomplishments along with our FY19 initiatives. I'm going to take a minute to highlight a few of those accomplishments for you. In FY18, we've increased the number of teams uh, of teams of teens participating in our youth venture program. 23 BCYF teams are part of this teen entrepreneurial program, learning everything from creating a business model, drafting a business plan, and launching a product or service. Over 1,700 girls participated in our citywide girl night activities and workshops throughout 2017. As part of the Girls Initiative, we have piloted a new girls leadership corps. Seven week, seven, a seven-week summer program at the BCYF Condon Community Center to increase girl opportunities in South Boston. We've nearly doubled our BCYF summer bar party attendance from previous numbers to 1,400 participants, paying special attention to attracting people who had not been engaged with BCYF program before and connecting them not only to our programs, but other city vital programs as well. The BCYF Draper Pool and BCYF Condon Community Center became a new six-day-a-week sites for the first time ever, now opening on, up on Saturdays. We celebrated several capital improvements, including the opening of the BCYF Parrot Street Community Center following a $12 million renovation, the opening of the yard at the BCYF Tobin Community Mission Hill 
which was another additional investment of $950,000 of renovations, has provided the community with a new open space for programming, special events, and we hope more. We have worked closely with the City of Boston's Law Department to draft Site Council MOUs. The MOUs will help address inconsistency across sites and help define the role and responsibilities of site councils. The MOU has been discussed with all councils and is expected to be signed by all parties during this summer. We've increased our outreach to Boston seniors through attending more senior resource fairs, adding senior page to our website, creating a senior marketing materials, and providing a database of BCY senior programming to Boston Elder Services providers. We have also listened to the community concerns and commitments and comments and opened an enhanced senior program at the BCYF Orenberger Community Center. For the first time ever, all our BCYF citywide summer programs are offered online with a new online registration process. Working with the foundation for BCYF, the development team increased the revenue raised at our annual fundraiser, HubNop, to 315,000, all of which goes back into our centers for programming. We've identified and secured many new sponsors over the course of the year, which allowed us to support BCYF programs such as Family Gym on Saturdays, the BCYF Street Workers, the Super Teens program, and supports the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs in creating immigrant information areas in selected BCYF centers. Now I'd like to mention a few of our initiatives for FY19. In FY19, we want to increase positive interaction with local youth strengthening community relations and to listen to and address the public safety concerns of residents. In the FY19 budget, we'll invest $1.6 million into the BCYF Street Worker Program to continue their work of reducing crime and violence in the community by building meaningful relationships with youth in need. This investment will bring more social services to promote safe neighborhoods in the city and bring more resources to youth and families. We are continuing the capital investments of the BCYF facilities with the completion of renovations to the BCYF Gallivan and Vine Street Community Centers this summer, upcoming renovations to the BCYF Curley and Matter Hunt Community Centers, and the Parish Street Pool as well. And also, we have some relocation studies for the BCYF Charlestown and Nazaro Community Centers, as well as a new Dorchester, possible Dorchester location. Thanks to the IT investments proposal process, we were provided and funded to acquire a new, a new, acquire a new and implement a new met tracking system that meets our data and operational needs. Provides constituent members with better service, integrates more seamlessly with BCYF and City of Boston systems, and will be able to grow and change as we do. We will partner with our foundation to continue to identify and engage strategic partnerships and secure new large institutional sponsors and financial supporters to support the important work that we do. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today to come speak to you. It's an honor to be working with the mayor and working with a city council that is committed to working with us to create transformative relationships. I look forward to discussing our proposed FY9 budget with you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Special appropriations uh, line on um, it's 56,200 special appropriations from FY18. Can you uh, explain what the special appropriation was? What was the, uh, the dollar amount on it? So it's $2 million. Sure. And it's under a special appropriation line at the very bottom of the budget sure. sheet. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the special appropriation for $2 million was actually the city's uh, uh, funneling the money through the BCYF process for the Urban Edge's new ice skating rink that's going to be proposed at the Jackson Square um, Center. Okay. So actually, it was just really bypass money that right. came through. And us. that's money from the TD Garden at the Hyde Square. Kids. Um, I don't. I, yeah, I think yeah. I, no. I think it was also the. Uh, I think the renewing of the lease two of the old city hall too as well. It was part of that 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 that, that earmark. Okay. Okay. Um, and it looks yeah. It, it looks like your <clears throat> budget went down significantly this year. So is that the the explanation? Well, that, yeah. That's that, part of the explanation. It came in and went out. Yeah. It came in and went out. That's part of the explanation. Also, there's been. Uh, 
a renewing of utility fees and so forth as well that that we're, we're looking at and they might be right. some costs and savings but overall we also have picked up because we picked up additional positions that are going to be very helpful to us um, right. you know like the Cleveland is relocating over to the Marshall so we've been able to pick up some additional staff there right. as well and then also getting the additional staff that we need to keep the both the Draper and the uh, and the uh, Condon open on Saturdays okay. so. uh, speaking of staffing yep. um, uh, 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 the increase or decrease in staffing or the same this year no, I think there's an increase if we yeah. want to uh, yeah, so for FY19, we're getting um, some additional positions at the Marshall Community Center. Um, we're getting two lifeguards and another um, a building manager position. Uh, and also at the Condon Community Center, we're getting um, two additional employees to help support the six-day-a-week operation. So we get a couple, but I think net it ends up coming out pretty, pretty similar, but we did gain a couple positions this year over last year. And uh, you mentioned about uh, setting up those immigrant, um, immigrant centers uh, at various sites. Could you provide us with uh, those sites? Yeah, I, I, I know that two of us, uh, it's Paris Street and, and Curtis Hall, and they're not immigrant center, they're immigrant information centers. So there's Correct, actually right. literature there uh, to basically support any new immigrants who might have any questions or concerns or are just looking for resources. Part of uh, that provides our staff with the opportunity to hand them information where they can contact either the Moya office or other offices that support um, their goals right. as they're trying to maneuver through this right. this, this era of immigration. Okay. And um, your budgeted amount for overtime um, has been exceeded every year, not unlike many departments. Mm -hmm. um, and you budgeted, you know, kind of the same for the past three years. Could you tell me what your overtime is to date right now uh, I'm pretty sure I mean obviously it's kind of like a um, snow removal budget where you always kind of budget the same thing you go over and you um, deal with it just not knowing where it's going to land um, but I think right now we're up around I think 200,000 right now give or take and most of that overtime is generated due to um, facilities snow removal and lifeguards um, if there's a if there's a lifeguard that's out obviously uh, we have ratios to maintain and want to make sure that we're, um, you know, properly staffed when it comes to lifeguards. So if someone calls out, there's a lot of that overtime is dedicated towards um, coverage with regards to the pools and lifeguards. Okay, great. Um, Councillor Edwards. Thank you. I just had a couple questions um, to go through some of our, your analysis about the MOUs, but also some of the services in my district. Mm -hmm. um, so first I want to commend you actually on your leadership and Thank getting you. ahead and working to make sure that the MOUs are in place mm -hmm. and that we were trying to get essentially transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, that is really to make sure that there's true equity in the centers as each one is raising its money but also have different resources in different communities to be able to raise money around them. So I want to say first thank you for that. And then I just wanted to ask for that update then in terms of not only are you preparing the MOUs, but is there, when is the, when will they have to be signed? Mm -hmm. And also if they aren't signed, what are, what are the next steps? Okay. Um, so far, it's great to report that majority of the councils that we've spoken to have been really favorable about it. They, I think they want the same thing too. They mm -hmm. want to have clear understanding about, you know, the, in the word partnership, is yes. the, 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 the rooted word is part, right? understanding the parts. So I think that we haven't really faced one that, that, that's put us in, in a situation where they're thinking that they're not going to sign or, or, or not sign. And um, continually, both the Chief and I, Chief Martinez and I, are continuing to still do round robins with a few last mm -hmm. sites that we have in place. And there is a, a upcoming meeting that we're going to have with the mayor and the councils again to kind of discuss it. Um, hopefully to maybe capture the last nooks that they may have or questions they might have in regards to it. But we, we feel pretty confident that sometime by this summer, all the councils will hopefully sign it and we'll be able to move on with the process um, as, as we perceive. And then hopefully some of the long-term strategies to hopefully look at how do we build on each other's capacities and strengths and then look at what could be mutual outcomes and goals and have some measurable metrics so that this way we are really aligning ourselves exactly. um, a little bit more tactically so that whenever a constituent walks into any one of those facilities, there is going to be an outcome of their experience in our, in our sites and hopefully we're going to get there with them. And it'll be a consistent one yep. where they can and find. And so, and part of that is still the commitment to having an online platform to hopefully pay. Yeah. Pay yep. And, and we're in discussions that right now with Audit and Do It 
around what might be those those other tools that we might be able to get. And, and just um, on the same vein um, for my education, about what percentage do you estimate on average uh, are the funds, the funds that are actually raised privately to help support a BCYF center? Um, I don't know if I was clear. Yeah. Uh, I, are you saying from all the sites? Yeah, on average, I mean, do you find that half the money for a BCYF center is coming from those councils and f private funds, or and then the other half coming from the city? Do you, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is the reason we wanted to do the okay. MEU to get a better clarity in regards to how funds are generated. Um, I can't tell you offhand what it is because they are independent 501c3s, so True. we can't pick, and, pick through their books. I mean, we can definitely surface 990s, but sometimes yeah. that doesn't paint the clear picture of what it is. But um, but like I said, currently right now I couldn't, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to be able to share that with the council and with the city in regards to what uh, how they actually collect and how they re reinvest back into the centers. Okay, so so summer is, a, is coming up and yep. I know that's really prime time for, for you guys. It's when you shine the most and, and the city probably needs your department the most during the summertime mm -hmm. um, because our kids are out there and I just again want to commend you for the work that you've done already in at least my district. I'm hearing about all the centers and the BCYF Paris Street, knowing that our pool is getting taken care of. That's a huge deal for us. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you and also um, personally thank uh, Mr. Soprizio for his work. I see him everywhere, um, fully dedicated to his community and the kids in the community. Um, but I wanted you to tell me a little bit more, educate me a little bit more about some of the prevention work that, or is BC, BCYF working in prevention of two areas? I know when it comes to street violence, absolutely. And, but also when it comes to, pre I think prevention work in terms of addiction and recovery needs to start young. Mm -hmm. And I, I we are in a crisis when it comes to that. So I, I would love to hear a little bit about your initiatives or hope, because I really, I do think that we need to have real conversations with our youth, um, unfortunately, but we do need to have that um, conversation. So I'd love to hear about that. Sure, I'm curious, you wanna present? Sure, thank you, um, and good morning, everybody. And uh, thank, morning. thanks for allowing me to be here today. <laughs> and thank you for all the great work that you all do in supporting all the neighborhoods that you are responsible for. Thank you. Um, you know, as, as we think of, th and that was a great question because I think it's something that we don't think about um, as much as we should. You know, um, substance abuse is clearly a, a concern as we, we see all the ravages of um, the opioid crisis across the country. And one of the things that, that, that I want to say is all the work that we do around prevention is really um, to, to address that issue. You know, as we think about the 40 camps that we're providing, mm -hmm. as we think about the, import, the, the employment opportunities that we're pro providing for young people, mm -hmm. as we think about the, the, the recreational opportunities that, that we provide, et cetera. But the one thing I think that, that, that is going to be great for us um, this summer, as we continue to work with um, the Office of Recovery is to really think about intentionally how we are giving young people the tools to address those issues. And um, we'll continue to, to, to um, work alongside the Office of Recovery, but the one thing that we did do um, in recent years is that we, we um, took all of our youth workers through a um, training around substance abuse and um, we, 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 in partnership um, with an external organization, we have a curriculum that, that we developed and that curriculum is still um, in use today and so um, we encourage our youth workers to continue to use that curriculum to engage young people. But especially, um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, you know, as young as six years old, you know, we have to um, have the conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and one, make sure that um, parents are, are, are part of that um, dialogue. And so, you know, we've been tr trying to figure out how to get more parental involvement around those types of conversations, which, as everyone knows, it's, it's not always easy um, and it's not something that is um, specific. To BCYF, I think that's always a challenge with a lot of youth serving agencies when they're trying to engage parents. But that's what we want to do. We want to engage per parents more around that issue. And um, speaking of uh, cohesive and working together, there are a lot of nonprofits that are dedicated to also working with our youth. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious about your relationships, um, or do you work with ROCA, um, mm -hmm. with EBEC in East Boston, the soccer programs, and just tell me how you, because yeah. the, the worst is that you have replication, yes. right? Yeah. You want to really build off of each other. Yes, yeah. yes. and um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that 
you know, is, is, is important and, and so that we're not duplicating services is that we're, we're, we're talking on a regular Talk basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we happen to be fortunate in that um, all the partners that you mentioned, we actually have close working relationships, so we talk on a, on a regular basis. Roca attends some of our meetings. We're out in East Boston all the time. And so, um, you know, we basically want to be able to, you know, fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And um, we can't fill in the gaps if we, we don't know where those gaps are. Um, we can't provide all the services, but we can certainly do a, a really good job with partnering with a lot of the external organizations who do amazing work and, and, and can help support um, Boston Center's youth and families. Uh, and my sorry. final question, yep. my final okay. question, Mark, okay. I promise, <laughs> is specifically um, about the, um, I think we discussed, but I want to be clear about the tennis bubble in Charlestown. Okay. That is going to be, tell me, so then that it's not decommissioned, but we're trying to make sure that we figure out a way to use that land or use that bubble. Sure. I mean, Has there been some follow-up? Yeah, uh, Council, so that bubble has been operated um, by BCUI, well, mm -hmm. it's been a BCUIF facility or asset um, for a number of years now. Um, the tennis courts themselves are owned by Boston Public Schools. Okay. Um, we've been in close partnership with, with uh, this, the Stillman Tennis Center. I've been in regular talks with both uh, BPS facilities, Parks and Rec, and also uh, Office of Neighborhood Services around um, how that's going to work. But the bubble reached the end of its life expectancy, and it actually lasted a lot longer than they would have typically thought it would. Um, it was deemed structurally in, you know, insufficient um, by both ISD and the vendor that does the, the, the uh, inflatable structure. So it ultimately had to be taken down and, and disposed of. Um, so I know the, uh, the folks from the Stillman Tennis Bubble continue to use the outdoor courts, um, and I know they continue in conversations with uh, neighborhood services and folks about the future of that. Um, BCYF, like I said, does not own that property. Um, BCYF's only tie to that property was the bubble itself. Okay. Um, so now that that's been removed, like I said, again, I know that those folks have been talking to neighborhood services and, and whatnot, and um, we've also been updating the mayor's office around that whole situation. Um, ultimately, I think the biggest question is what the future of that looks like, um, and, you know, we're happy to help uh, in any way necessary, but really the big part of BCOF's operation has now been um, removed, removed from that facility. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And we've been joined uh, by uh, a large city councilor in East Sabi George, as well as a large councilor, Ayanna Presley. The chair recognizes Councilor Janey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, just to kind of echo the comments and questions and concerns raised by my colleague, uh, Councilor Edwards around the MOU. I think it's very important um, that it's moving forward so that we have accountability and transparency. I think it's also very mm -hmm. important for equity to make sure that the different centers are much more equitable. But I think it's also important to maintain uh, that kind of community spirit and that they mm -hmm. continue to be community driven yep. in this process. I'm hoping that you can come back to us with some sort of report that answers some of the specific questions that were asked today. Um, I have some questions about Vine Street and the renovations there. Is it still on track to be completed by October 2018 of this yeah. year? Yes, uh, yes it is, it's still on track. Uh, renovations are going extremely well, the place looks great. Um, they're making a lot of progress. Uh, I go to the weekly job meetings there and, and things are looking really good. We obviously do that in partnership with the Public Facilities Department. Um, no issues with regards to timeline or schedule, so um, we're very much on track for the same, for that completion date. Uh, and just so that you're um, clear, I, I do have concerns about the diversity of the workers on that job site, okay. that there isn't uh, diversity. Now was that, that was $4 million out of 18, FY18? Yes. Somewhere around yes, that? Yes, somewhere around that number. Okay. So it's on s track for completion. What's happening in terms of the services in, in the interim during the renovations? Have they been moved to another community center? Yes. Yeah, so what we're doing right now is the staff and the programs have been relocated between either the, um, the Blackstone Community Center in the South End and Madison Park Community Center, which is in close proximity to Vine Street. So those are the two sites that have uh, seen a majority of the, um, the services that were offered prior. Um, and also the Tobin Community Center, which is also very close proximity. 
Okay, wonderful. Um, with the Grove Hall site, um, I know they're doing senior programming, which I think is really important. Are there any plans to add youth programming there? Currently, plans for youth programming, no, not anything concrete. What we have done is work with Project Right in the past, who continues to get access to the space for both the community meetings, and they have used it for youth usage. Now, we could actually look at having conversations with them about what they might want to continue to use the space in the evening, but we've dedicated staff to be there to have the facility open um, until about seven o'clock, I believe, even though the, the seniors are done with their space at five to make sure that there's still community usage of the space. Um, we've had talks, and, and because we're in the MOU process with the Holland Community Council Center, uh, 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 501c3 to maybe look at trying to do youth programming there, but we just want to get through this process of the MOU so they can have a little bit clarity of regards what resources will be a, available to them, what resources might return back to us that could be invested there. But um, at no time has there never been a, a, a if anyone uh, or a partner has expressed any interest in using the space for something youth related in the evenings, we've always made it available. That's good to hear. Okay. Um, the street workers, so 1.6 million for FY19, is that level funding? Is that the same as it was for FY18 for no, the street worker program? Is that that increase? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of an increase. Mike. Okay. Um, I think what we're, we're doing too is that there was questions in regards to that part of our street worker program was also the violence interrupters that would merge with the street safe. Part of the, the new funding would allow us to absorb uh, some of the violence interrupters into the street worker model as well, and uh, this way continue to make sure that the numbers uh, will continue to support the needs of the city in regards to working with the most vulnerable population of young men uh, and women um, who may be court involved, gang involved, you know, mean or or disengaged in some way. And do you think the numbers are meeting the needs of the city, or should there be an increase here? Yeah beyond the 1.6? So I think one of the things that we're, we're, we're trying to accomplish this year as we think about the reinvestment is ensuring that not only is it adequate amount of staff on the ground, but we're able to, to allocate some of those resources towards providing the wraparound services that are needed for, for young people. And so one of the things that we're looking to do as we, you know, it's been three years since we um, worked alongside the Boston Foundation to, to um, um, incorporate their street safe staff into um, um, BCYF. It was uh, $3.1 million at the time. And we're at the end of um, um, that funding. So the funding um, is, is um, basically going to be um, drying up after uh, probably at the end of this uh, fiscal year. And uh, uh, well, actually, um, going into the beginning of the, the next fiscal year. But one of the things that we think is critically important is gives us an opportunity to really think about, you know, how we're um, operating um, in terms of the, the structure of the um, work. And so I think that we're going to um, really be able to be intentional around not only having adequate staff out on the ground. We currently have 47. Um, we don't anticipate um, those numbers dwindling much, but the addition, um, I think we're gonna have to really think about how do we provide the wraparound services, which currently um, the, the street workers are building the relationships with young people on the ground, but also going around and, 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 and securing those um, wraparound services. And just to follow up on that, so currently 47, does this FY19 budget see an increase in FTEs or no? It stays at 47? It, it, there won't be an, an, an increase. Um, how will you? Uh, all, all, mm -hmm. all, all 40, um, 47 staff are not on the operating budget. Um, so there's um, 32, um, 28 street workers, and um, four senior street workers. And then there's an additional uh, 15 um, violence interrupters. Oh, that's helpful to yeah. understand. Um, in terms of that funding source that's drying up, are there plans to replace that somehow? Has someone else stepped in to provide some additional support for this area or no? We, we've been working um, with some external folks around that, addressing that issue. Okay. Um, can you tell us about the MOA with Boston Public Schools? Um, you want to? Yeah. Um, so we had a prior uh, MOU in place with Boston Public Schools. I think dated back, it was signed in, I believe, 2009. 
Um, we've been in close talks with Boston Public Schools as, as well as the council and we use to get that because of the, such a close relationship between the two agencies to get something showed up. Um, BCYF has made some recommendations, some edits to the MOU that's been handed over to uh, Boston Public Schools for their review and their um, feedback from their principals. And then what we're planning on doing is getting the new MOU signed and rolled out to all of our um, site coordinators that are in school buildings as well as the school principals from those schools so that everyone's on the same page. But we're just waiting on um, feedback from Boston Public Schools on their end and then hopefully um, you know, hopefully get an imp implementation and, and sign prior to the uh, summer. Are you able to share what those changes would be here with us today? There wasn't, the, the MOU that was put together in 2009 was really good. It was really kind of covering our both concerns and both needs. What it was more of was just that folks became unfamiliar with the document um, due to turnover in both BCYF and turnover of both with principals that they just didn't even know that the you know the inf the document existed and the enforcement of it and that it was it was around because it's signed by folks that are no longer here so it wasn't so much the content of the document that wasn't good it was more or less the refresher getting updated signatures getting a new um, refreshed agreement um, some of the things were small I mean some of the things we recommended on our end are just you know ensuring that um, you know ensuring that schools are, are cleared during snowstorms and things like that when we have to open our facilities um, I mean we work very well with Boston Public Schools so it wasn't any major changes just just small kind of different things around scheduling and permitting and things like that there wasn't anything too major because like I said the document was pretty good at addressing a lot of our um, issues and concerns from from the original document in 2009 thank you Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and we've been joined by uh, at-large City Councilor Michael Flaherty, uh, Councilor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, I just have a couple things, really. Uh, first, I'll start with a good thing: the uh, the Mattapan uh, uh, capital uh, budget and at the Matta Hunt. <clears throat> Could you just give me a quick quick uh, overview of uh, the timeline and the total expense? Uh, as you guys know, the Matta Hunt's gone through a transition. It's mm -hmm. been a tough time for that immediate neighborhood with the uh, closing and reopening of the school in a, in a different vehicle, uh, Wheelock and some of the issues that we've had there. Um, it's a great community center, a great location, and uh, this is money uh, well spent by, uh, by the mayor and, 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 uh, and community center. So if you just give me a, an update on uh, the total expense and, and maybe a timetable and when, we, when we're going to start having uh, community meetings regarding uh, what exactly is going to happen. Yeah, sure. Um and, and Mike can maybe add a little bit more of this, but when we look at this, it's supposed to be a schedule improvement of 1.9 million. Uh, BCF took back the operation back in July of 2015, and ironically enough, I was the one at Wheelock who took it from the city, so when I came back, I had to take it back. So I'm the guy from the both <laughs> You can't ends. get I'm rid the, of it. I'm the bookends, right, for, mm -hmm. for, for both projects. Uh, but we've been able to maintain community access there and work with the school as it transitioned to, into an early education center, and we had great success in the facility since taking it back. And so I think that the capital uh, investments are just gonna hopefully help us augment its, its presence there um, even furthermore. Uh, and we had sort of this uh, uh, light conversation with Parks and Recs too in regards to that space and looking at what could be the potential too with a beautiful feel in the back that if it got a little bit of TLC, uh, who knows what the impact would be. But right. um, you have anything else to you wanna add, Mike? Yeah, just that it, it like, like, um, like the commissioner is stating it's around two million dollars. We haven't done designer selection yet, so obviously that still has to happen. And then um, once the designer is selected, we'll get more into the nitty gritty around the um, the public comments and the in the community outreach side of it. Um, but it's it's focused around I think some work. A lot of the wor the work is focused on the community center parts of the building, so the gym. Uh, the community room, some fresh improvements in, in those areas to help us, because I know as part of the changeover to an early education center, um, BPS had promised, um, you know, and had spoke about some improvements to the community center as part of that transition. So um, we're very excited to be back um, and be there, you know, to serve that community, and we're excited about the $2 million investment that the, that the mayor has dedicated towards that center to help us improve some of the spaces that, that we have, like I said, gym, um, the gym and the community space there. So we're excited about that, but we're not quite at the point council yet of, of designer selection. Okay. So um, hopefully we'll be getting there soon. That's great. And then <clears throat> as we move forward, uh, I want to thank you for that because it's really important to the community. Um, and um, we'll mention the, uh, the field that's next door. Um, <clears throat> Chris knows we've been cleaning that 
for years. It's more of a it's more of a vacant lot that happens to be mowed more so than an actual playing surface. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward with future capital plans, that would be a perfect. And, and I know Chris Cook is going to is going to kill me for even <laughs> bringing it up, but you know that would be a perfect. Uh, opportunity to put like another turf field in and I know they're expensive but once when they're down I mean we all know Almont Park is just jam-packed it's, mm -hmm. it's become the jewel of, uh, of, of Parks and Rec and uh, it would really be nice to, if we could take a look at that field rehab that field uh, for you know soccer lacrosse uh, cricket I mean it can be an all-purpose turf so it's a great great piece of land we should be looking at um, <clears throat> my second question is on the extended hours uh, and the schedule changes of the community centers. Um, I've got a number of great community centers, great directors, they run great programs. Um, how effective has the, uh, the changes in hours, the additional days, that type of stuff uh, worked, uh, not only in District 5 but th throughout the city? Have we found that we've, it's, been a, it's been a good change or, or not? I mean, I mean, overall for me, I think it's been a good change. I've had constituents come to me and said, you know, the fact that now Sundays are open at certain facilities, it gives me time to do things with my family. As you know, um, our, you know, we have families that are, you know, have, are working into Saturdays now, and sometimes they just don't have that time to spend with their kids. So I've gotten at least some good feedback. Um, I think staff have really kind of sort of adjusted into the, into the, into the work hours, into the schedules. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can continue to kind of look at it a little bit closer. And I'm hoping that when we make the new investment into our new sort of membership and data system, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It would allow the most important uh, person who, who hasn't been asked about how the hours are working, and that's our constituents. Because I think that constituents can actually help inform whether you know the early morning hours opening up are, are really beneficial to them, um, to their lifestyle, and who they are as as, as users of it. Um, but hopefully, allow us to capture even a more additional number, uh, those numbers more accurately, and give us a good picture of what you know what certain hours are doing and, and how they're being utilized to allow us to make whatever adjustments we need to make sure that they work. But I can tell you that in the evening hours, especially in the communities that have been uh, most impacted with the concerns of violence and not giving many opportunities for kids to participate, uh, those residents have spoke volumes. It's great that they can pick up their kid at 9 o'clock, but they're in a safe space like the Shelbourne Community Center or at the Vine Street when the Vine Street was open at that hour and that we weren't shutting them down at 8 or 7 o'clock like right. what we've, we've had previously. So, right. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you. And it, it will work uh, once we start to capture those numbers. Yeah. It, it'll the proof will be in the pudding. So I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, and my last question, I bring it up every year um, since I've been on the council, is uh, the fundraising for. Um, and I know uh, I met with Chief Martinez, who's hiding up there in the crowd. First row. You must be doing all right. <laughs> um, but uh, having said that, you know, the fundraising uh, for each community center, each community center does it differently, whether it's road races or golf tournaments or other things. Uh, the one thing that we've talked about at length, and I just want to see where we're at with it, is uh, the renting out of space um, for uh, community functions. Uh, particularly in District 5, we don't have a lot of uh, large function halls that can do 80, 100, 120, 200 people, whether it's a senior event. Um, I know uh, uh, to my left, Councilor O'Malley has several big spaces like the uh, Irish Social Club. Um, you know, we, we don't really have any big spaces like that. And uh, the resistance in the previous administration for, uh, you know, beer and wine and having it. Now, I don't mean to turn every single community center into the Irish Emerald Society. Uh, but having said that, uh, <laughs> we're missing, I think we're missing a great opportunity um, to raise some dough for uh, the community center without actually constantly hitting the same people to to sponsor holes in the golf tournament, to run the road race, to to go to the you know whatever the next function is. So where are we with that? Have we have we looked into that a little bit deeper? I think I mean we scratched a little bit of the surface. I mean I think some of the biggest concerns is the liability. You know what I mean and having clarity on who owns the <coughs> liability. Um, you know, it's one of those things that with the, with the new structure of the MOUs, right, some of the rental fees and membership fees are actually returning back to the city, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so part of it is I think we have to continue to look at it a little bit more closer and, and, and just make sure um, that you, you, we might say just beer and wine, but God forbid if something happens and it gets tracked back to the center, you know what I mean? <coughs> Who actually owns it is, is the biggest question that we have to yeah. kind of surface, you know? Well, so, and I think also, too, Council, using a City of Boston facility to raise money is an issue also. So um, he, he, here's the thing, and I'll, yeah. I'll just end it with this. Yeah. 
the city of Boston, we continue to hide behind the word liability. And it's not a criticism, it's just mm -hmm. my own opinion. Mm -hmm. Every time we try to go outside the bounds of whatever we used to do, it's, all liability, who's to blame? Mm -hmm. We have a whole sixth floor worth of lawyers up there. They should be able to figure mm -hmm. this out. And it's, it's the, the people who need it the most. If you can make a couple thousand dollars in, in a facility and not hit up the same people who are actually paying for the kids to go to the begin yeah. with, I think it's a positive. So yeah, I, think I think that the sixth floor um, can probably figure that out. So thanks. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we've been joined by Council President Andrea Campbell. Uh, Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank right. you for all you do. Uh, I want to just begin by echoing the sentiments by my good colleague from District 5. Um, you know, change, change can be uncomfortable, as we know, but um, I think sometimes we need to get outside of our own comfort zone and, and sort of embrace new ideas, particularly as it relates to the sustain sustainability of such important programs. Um, can you talk a little bit, um, Will, on sort of, uh, there was a lot of concern at the Orenberger Community Center last year when we were sitting in this room about changes and how you've been able to work to address that, as specifically as it relates to senior programming. Okay, great, um, yeah, sure. Um, I think that last year what we had was really sort of an understanding of who actually had occurred the cost of, of running senior programming there. And I think that sitting with Kathy Cummings and Dave Gorman and, and kind of exploring more, um, you know, we were able to find a, a solution to the, to the need there in regards to senior programming um, that I think has been mutually beneficial to, to, to both the city and, and to the council itself, you know. And so, um, I'm very proud. I had actually had, had, had hoped to actually invite some of those seniors here to actually testify today who have been benefiting from that program. And one, one of the things that's really beautiful is that is to also see them also get tapped to other city support services as well. Mm -hmm. You know, some have been connected uh, to some of the housing, uh, senior housing support that tends to happen. Some of them can't get on top of their roofs and clean those yeah. gutters out. And so we've seen those, those dots being connected because of, of, because of the relationship. And I think it served as an example, one to the point that one of the recent benefits that I've seen is that now the Curtis Hall, which is under your, 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 uh, your, your, your district, is actually tapping uh, the expertise over at the Orenberger to think about what does senior programming look and how does it get reinvented, reinvented at, at Curtis Hall. So we've seen that, that when we work in, in, a, in a very collaborative uh, uh, way, that we can have a collective impact in how our communities can actually be served and, and do the work that we're doing. Um, and, and it's really nice because uh, we just recently had a, a, a really good MOU talk uh, with the Orenberger Council too as well. And, and, um, and, and I think that we're in a way better place than, we, than we've ever been in the I past. Agree. So I agree, I agree. And when was the last time the MO, at least as it relates to the Orenberger, when was the last MOU written with the Orenberger? Uh, well, there wasn't. It was just the one plan mm -hmm. of operations that was written in 1973, 74 under the white administration. Yeah, so yeah. that, this is gonna be a very new thing for a lot of the councils, but I think it's one that uh, they themselves have, have, have been wanting as well because it kind of spells out uh, a lot of things have changed in 40 years and especially the way nonprofits work with city entities or with, with local government. Um, and I think this gives it a little bit more clarity in, in, in understanding what our parts yeah. are. And what I agree, doing. I agree. M many of these uh, agreements haven't been updated in many of our lifetimes, so this yep. is an important step and I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, last word on this, so ju just so those that are watching can sort of understand or perhaps mm -hmm. for the edification of my colleagues, uh, with the, uh, the hour changes were in introduced last year as a means of opening centers um, to more people with the later hour, the, particularly the school site-based centers to uh, have more staff there in the later hours after school to try to get mm -hmm. more kids uh, and more young people and more working adults involved in the programming. Um, as it relates to the Orenberger, which probably serves more seniors than many of your organizations just by virtue of the demographics of West mm -hmm. Roxbury, um, there was concern that the programming would be removed because it's typically at the 11 a.m. or 12 noon hour. No, no, this I'm, yeah, yeah, this I'm sort of explaining. Mm -hmm. So what was able to have been done, the, uh, the new hours were to remain sort of later, yet we were able to bring in someone who could, a senior coordinator who could help coordinate that yeah. program. Exactly. And so, so there has been zero loss of senior programming yep. between offered right now and what was offered two years ago. Yeah, great, perfect, thank you. Um, and then have you seen memberships increase with the hour changes or with the 
you know, with the later hours? Yeah, I mean, like I said, one of the reasons that we're glad that we got selected to do its sort of a capital yeah. process is that we have a very outdated system that sometimes doesn't capture those numbers the way we would love to capture them, at, you know, accurately. Can uh, you even as, ballpark? As, yeah, uh, number of memberships, Mike, you get a ballpark on what membership numbers? Um, I have it here somewhere. I can flip through. I'll try to All right, put my you can finger find on it. Mike, oh, we can get it back, well, get it back to you. But yeah, yeah, I'm more curious than anything else because I think, yeah. you know, Will, you, you also have had a great career at YMCA yeah. before mm -hmm. this. I'm a member of both community yep. centers and YMCA, and I know that you wanted to make community centers yeah. a real rival for the YMCA. So that'll be helpful if we can get the uh, even yeah. approximate numbers and, and use that as a metric to check, you know, yeah. quarterly. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, STEAM programs that are being offered at Curtis Hall in Jamaica Plain? The senior programs? STEAM. Oh, STEAM programs? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm more familiar with the one that's being offered in, at the Menino Center, uh, which is in the Archdale Housing Development. I know that STEAM continues, and STEAM is you know, science, technology, yeah. engineering, and I'm assuming the, that your A arts. is the art. Arts and, and, <laughs> and, and math. Yeah. Uh, but I know that we've had a robotics program over at the Menino Center that really looks very favorable. Uh, one of the things that we've done in the last year is that we've actually, and, and I think I might have said this last year, we attempted last year to make sure that we can create a platform for the administrative coordinators to come together and talk yep. and look at three key areas, right? Program, operations, right? And staff development yep. and care. Let, let me just cut you yes. off. So, so there was a specific uh, aquarium partnership with Curtis Hall, the New England Aquarium. Chris okay, is Chris could probably but, uh, yeah. nodding his head. Can you talk about that at Curtis yeah. Hall, please? Yes. Um, so we, we um, work partnered with the um, aquarium to, to create this uh, yeah. um, STEAM program over, over at uh, Curtis Hall. And it operates um, on Sunday. And um, the attendance has been phenomenal it, it, it's just been uh, a breath of fresh air to see so many um, families taking advantage of the opportunity and so um, we, we went back and sit, talked to um, the aquarium and said hey we'd love to, to expand it and so we're adding an additional site um, Paris Street um, and we hope and is the aquarium I'm sorry to cut you off are they paying for this yeah so yeah. it's so it costs no cost, taxpayers cost nothing. No, and how no many how many kids participated at Curtis Hall? I don't have the exact numbers. Um, I can get them to you. But enough that it was oh, a positive enough program you were Absolutely. I, I've gone over there a couple of Sundays, and um, the families, they, they, they come out, and they really enjoy it. That's great. That's great. And then finally, a program that I am incredibly proud of that has been around since I was a young person is Camp Joy. And, and you guys, BCYF runs Camp Joy. How, do you have the numbers on that, how many kids participate in Camp Joy every summer? And have we seen an increase? Do we have enough young people involved as counselors? Camp Camp Joy um, is is I, you know it's one of my favorite programs. Yeah. First of all, um, I think um, Mr. Roberta Small, who is up here in the audience and, and does a, a wonderful job with organizing that um, program, not just in the summer but year round. But in the summertime, you know, um, it's just a, a great opportunity to, to provide some some equitable programming for 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 families who sometimes um, don't have the means right. to to, to um, right. you know get play, get get services for for so their young families for special and needs, right? Yeah, and so um, you know, th th this year we're really um, hoping that if nothing else, we're able to be a little bit consistent. We had over yeah. a, about 250 um, young people participate last year, and we're hoping to, to keep that level um, at, at best. And so, um, you know, one thing I do want to say is, you know, it's been um, quite some time since um, the staff have been able to um, get any um, funding in terms of um, you know, their salaries. And so that's one of the things that we're really You're working on. You're talking about the council? The, yeah, the council the yeah. yeah, the council's staff that, you know, they work really hard. Yep. And, um, you know, we, we, we're just hoping that um, we're, we're able to provide that um, little bump for them so that they can continue to do the work that they're doing. Good. And so no money is allocated currently in the budget for a little bump for the counselors at Camp Joy? <laughs> So, well, r technically right now, we're, we're working with Roberta to try to reallocate some money. There's okay. some new ISD DPH guidelines around the ratios, so the ratios are getting a little stricter for that program. Um, so Roberta's currently working um, through that to try to reallocate some money so we can possibly get increases for her staff. She kind of struggles with short program, couple of weeks, 
gets competitive for, for staff that are looking for jobs. Um, so she's really trying to figure out a way to incentivize working for Camp Joy so that she can get the qualified yeah. help that she needs. Obviously, you need RNs and nurses course, and, yeah. and, and people that are qualified. So she's really being creative this year and working that through. But we're trying to use the money previously allocated to compensate them and give them a little bit of a raise. Um, and again, also battling with the more stricter ratios that have been placed through the uh, DPH regulations. So um, we got some plans in place to hopefully uh, address both. Well, both I would of those love ends. to be helpful with that during our budget process as well, because okay. it seems like it's a, a common sense solution. And then finally, as it relates to Camp Joy, do we uh, work at all with the families who participate in, say, the Jason Roberts Challengers League or other um, uh, sport programs for um, kids dealing with uh, special needs, mental and physical uh, needs to, to uh, make sure they're aware of Camp Joy and to sort of help grow that number so that 250 is the baseline, not the not the ceiling. Yeah, we 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 you know one of the things that that um, the marketing department marketing and communications does very well is um, engage external partners to one you know do some outreach in terms of making sure that they're aware that Camp Joy exists. But also, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who actually do some really good stuff out there, um, like Strive. Um, yep. And so, you know, we're always talking with them just to, you know, figure out how we can support each other. But, yes, we, we, we spend quite a bit of time um, around marketing and communications and outreach. Good. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Savi-George. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I have a couple questions about uh, the decline or the drop in uh, spending plan for sports and the sports and fit fitness category it's about a two million dollar um, decrease and I'm just uh, interested in in why so page 16 of our notes um, in that overall category All right you go from I, I'm um, assuming it might be a, an appropriation that was there that I, I, you came in after we discussed it was a two million that was allocated to I guess uh, Urban Edge around the ice skating and field oh, facility. Okay, so I'm that's sorry. the piece. That's why it shows okay, that your money's dropped. That's where it okay. came um, Thank you for that clarification. Um, and also, um, Mike mentioned the addition of two new lifeguards for this coming year or the mm -hmm. new fiscal year. And there was also two new lifeguards added last year as well. Um, but there is a decrease in the number of kids that are accessing, or individuals, I guess they might not be kids, that are accessing some of the aquatics programming. Um, there's a decrease from, I think, like 23,000, 24,000 was projected for this current year. Um, that's also on page 16. And now there's a target of 2,000. 23,000 to 20. So page 16 under sports and okay. fitness again. So I just, I, I'm a big proponent of teaching kids yeah. how to swim. I think that we yeah. should have, I think it should be mandated in all of our public schools that kids learn how to swim before they graduate. Um, especially being a harbor city, but I just think it's a great life-saving skill. Um, so I just, you, there's a change in the targets of kids who will learn how to swim um, as part of your targets. So I'm, I guess I'm reiterating the importance yeah. of teaching oh, no, no, kids how to swim, but trying to understand why we've dropped the, the projected target of kids who will participate in the aquatics programming. I, I, I don't know why we, we dropped the, the, the projected number, but I, I do want to say that I, I concur um, with the importance of, of every young person in this city having an opportunity to learn how to swim. Um, you know, uh, I'm a young person. Oh, I used to be a young person in the city <laughs> who grew people. up um, and, and, and did not learn how to swim. <laughs> And actually, just started to learn how to swim. Oh, congratulations! And and That's and great. one one of the things that that, that I want to say is that you know we we run a, a, a unbelievable aquatics program, and you know Jeff and and, and Tony um, have worked really hard to. To, to grow that program. We had over 300 um, young people who just recently participate in our, our, our swim league championship that was phenomenal. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoy about the, the, the aquatics program, not only the opportunity for young people to learn how to swim, is that um, that's the one place where we know we get great parent participation um, because parents don't leave their children at the at the pool. <laughs> they stay there. And, um, you know, I, I certainly um, can concur. And I know that those pools get a lot of good use. I was at the Flaherty pool the other day and the Draper pool the other day, and both of those pools were, were, were um, 
lots of young people there learning how to swim. So I, we certainly agree with you, and I think we got to go back and look at that. Thank you. How many of our centers have pools? We have um, 17, uh, 17 pools. Out of the 35, is there any opportunity for partnership between the community centers that don't have pools? And the community centers that do absolutely, yes. we we encourage it. And actually, you know, as we think about, you know, prevention and intervention, we think that is one of the the great ways to get young people to get to know each other. As yeah. we, um, you know, introduce young people across the city, um, you know, in a a space where there's a pool. Um, or, or a gym that they may not have or a rock yeah. wall that they, they may not have. It gives them an opportunity to get to know each other. And so um, we, we, we certainly encourage that with our youth workers. And also, just, to, just to add to as well, you know, I mean, um, we're going to uh, be making a reinvestment in the Paris Street pool. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we're moving from the Cleveland to the Marshall that has a pool that's been drained and not operational. You know what I mean? Is one that hopefully we hope to be having, hopefully to be begin to invest the work in it to hopefully have it operational. Hopefully by the next fiscal year that we'll add another community pool, bringing us up to 18 pools in our, in our community. Um, but I think that when you're looking at the data, sometimes I think that some of our challenges is also our data system that sometimes doesn't capture the the, the data that we wanted to capture. And we're hoping that with a new system that we're going to be bringing online, we'll have to give us the, the the real data that we need to make sure that we can drive decisions in regards to the programs that we do. But swimming to me is is very important, just given the fact that my first year here, the tragedy I had to deal with as as a commissioner, it's the one area that I'm very committed. Um, to make sure that we can continue to improve and make sure that always our next is better than our now and what we do with kids in water. Um, and I think that it also provides an, uh, an ample opportunity, especially as we experience lifeguard shortages, so does the WISE, so do the Boys and Girls Club. And how do we become sort of the pipeline to make sure that we can give those kids those opportunities into those meaningful jobs to be their first places of employment. So swimming is going to be a really big key piece to, uh, piece to us to do the work that we do. So. Well, I know pools are very expensive to run. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, UMass Boston is looking to get rid of their pool. And there's some, some programming that mm -hmm. happens there that some of our other community pools can take advantage of. I also think in partnership with the Boston Public Schools, my desire yeah. to get kids to swim, your desire to get more lifeguards on board, I think that could really create some job Synergy. opportunity for our young people, but then also a, a greater awareness of water safety, um, but then also you make some money on the other end um, yeah. with it. So I, I wonder if there's any opportunity, especially with our BCYF centers that are connected to or close to the Boston Public Schools, when we have a relationship between the center and the school, has BCYF looked to uh, partner at all with Build BPS or at least be at the table when there's conversations about Build BPS and your facilities? Because I know some schools where they're connected, the kids during the day use your space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that relationship shouldn't end um, sort of at the end of the school day or you know whatever it is that there's a longer uh, relationship that could be related to build BPS. Yeah. Are you at, involved at all in those conversations? Not, not some, I don't think, believe so with the, with the build BPS kind of models, but we are in conversations under Chief, Mar Chief Martinez's leadership about looking at the spaces that we do share with schools, right? And what can we do to co hopefully complement what the school curriculum has to offer? And I think that it, when we look at it, you know, safety is always going to be a big issue regardless of whatever form it is, if it's in the form of uh, providing, uh, you know, early drug prevention, education, violence prevention, et cetera. The fact that, that when we look at kids and how they're attracted to water, me being a father of five, they take off on me wherever, <laughs> if I'm in a pool or in a beach, I think could be another way that we can kind of look at being a little bit more creative and thinking outside the box and creating those opportunities to work with BPS. Um, you're already utilizing what's what's in the schools that we're tied with at pools. So. Great. And I'm at the end of my time, so yep. I'll save the rest for the next round. Thank you. Yep. Council Presley. And we've been joined by Councilor Ed Flint, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all uh, for your partnership in this work. Uh, thank so you. critical to um, the development of our young people and just the role you play in community uh, all around. Um, so I wanted to thank you for reopening the Marshall Community Center in Dorchester and for the expanded hours uh, in the Condon. And I'm not sure if I missed it while I was in the midst of my copious note taking on something else, but are there plans to expand hours at any other BCYF locations? 
No, I think that the expansion of the hours happened when we did the hours changed. Okay. Um, so uh, overall. Yeah, when I when I like I said when I came on board, it was about uh, I think we had at that time 34, 35 facilities, all different operational hours. The fact that we went to consistent hours, Standardized. keeping them open to 9:30, it, it's it's really a good where we are as far as the threshold in regards to to there. Um, expanding to the condom was really kind of a no-brainer. It's a, a, a community that um, access to a to an indoor basketball court and now having access to the pool on Saturdays might even help with the uh, increasing the, the swim lessons as well sure. for that community. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I think you know where 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 we are where we want to be in regards to the the hours of operation. I think part of it is now really to make sure that that our constituents know. Um, that we're here, we're open and ready to serve them. So. And so how do you track uh, that foot traffic in order to, to better understand, you know, um, what are the correlations? So I know you all have done door knocking and canvassing before. Yeah. I know we have, you know, uh, aggressive sort of multimedia campaigns. And this is one of the biggest challenges for us in government is that we can do all of that and, you know, say if you build it, they will come, but that's yeah. only if they know about yeah, it, yeah. right? So um, how do you, you know, gauge based on your outreach uh, platforms and efforts if you're then seeing a, a comparable or commiserate uh, uptick? How do you gauge foot traffic right now? Is it, you know, do you click folks as they come in? You know, how are you yeah. getting a sense of that? I mean, we have a, a data system now that, I mean, it's one that when I got here was it needed a revamp and needed a rework. Um, uh, I know that in the last couple of years, under the leadership of, 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 of Chris Biner, when he was the interim, it was something in area of focus M12. Um, I mean, we have a, a system called Boss Tracks, known, uh, it, it's familiar, it's similar to the one that the Boys and Girls Club app calls Kid Tracks. You know I mean, that okay. tends to track our members, but what happens is so many man manual elements of it that I sometimes. So there's a margin a, of error. In a margin of error because of the error. fact okay. that getting the time to get back and actually input to upload. Um, becomes a really redundant process when we live in a day and age that a simple swipe of your card and then it would automatically upload as is Mike there any says. sort of software investment or anything yeah, there is. that could change that and, and so what's happened recently is that we've gotten um, through the capital process through the do it sort of uh, technology uh, investment we've gotten a uh, an allocation to actually revamp our system and to look at what a brand new system um, could be introduced into our system so we're at currently right now in the preliminary talks to explore okay. what would that mean bringing in a project manager and to look at working with our teams who are in our buildings to kind of share their thoughts around the process okay. so that we hopefully will have that but in regards to outreach and, and the communication to I mean one of the great things about having site councils is that they're rooted in the community they not only attend the meetings that happen at BCYF, but they attend the meetings that happen sure. in the community. And so they're great ambassadors about getting the word out about what services we're, we're offering our community. Uh, another great resource to us is the, is the street worker program. To me, I always say, to, I always envision, I say uh, about them is that there are centers without walls because they're really in every back sure. alley. They're well, in every street well, corner. Let me just they're ask a question. So based on, yeah. I'm just trying to get a sense of, yeah. do you know right now which are your centers that have the highest and the lowest foot traffic? Because, you know, that to me presents an opportunity for us oh, yeah. as we're thinking about community-based organizations and trying to sync up outreach efforts. Yeah. I'm just trying to gauge if the, the kids that are the most vulnerable and have the greatest need or the seniors that feel the most marginalized or whatever, yeah. again, getting back to the equity point, how do we gauge that if we don't have the data? So do you have a sense even anecdotally as to which centers have the highest foot traffic and which yeah, have sure. the lowest? Mm -hmm. So we, okay. yeah, yeah. The, yeah, so we, yeah. we know, I mean, overall visits counselor. Um, so the uh, Curley Community Center is the most trafficked center uh, in South Boston, followed uh, by Curtis Hall, looks like to our calculation. So we can, we can the, the system does, it, it counts people is yeah. what really okay. the system does. So we can absolutely tell you the highest yeah. foot traffic to the lowest attendance. I mean, in some of our decisions, obviously, with regards to centers have been based on that data. Okay. So we can so, do that, so, but we So Carly and Curtis are the top two. So what are the two lowest performing? Um, sorry, I'm just gonna run over the numbers quick. That's okay. Uh, looks like Draper Pool. Um, which obviously it's just a pool as opposed to a community center sure. that might have a pool and other things to offer. And the Menino Community Center in Rosendale look like the two lowest right now. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. so we'll stay tuned on that. Yeah. Um, in that vein, could you talk to me about any evening youth programming in the Grove Hall area specifically? We hear a lot of feedback from youth and community-based organizations that, 
you know, there's nothing that specifically um, uh, targeted would be too aggressive a word, but uh, accessible for them. So could you speak to that in terms of evening programming for youth in the Grove Hall area? Yeah, so um, as, as, we, as the commissioner uh, mentioned earlier, we don't have um, um, a dedicated um, youth That's program yeah. at, um, at the Grove Hall Community Center. However, um, we've tried to um, partner with um, some external folks, um, Project Right and um, others, to provide some programming. Uh, we have a... a uh, um, a senior center that's at the um, Grove Hall Community Center currently. However, um, you know, we do um, have some staff who work in and around that community, um, street worker staff, and they're supporting some of the um, um, efforts that take place with Mike and Al's Basketball League and other um, opportunities that Project Right um, provides. Um, we have a, another community center that is in close proximity to Grove Hall. It's not actually in Grove Hall. Um, the BCYF um, Holland Community Center, and um, we have two youth workers there, um, and they do a really good job of um, providing some youth um, um, programming. So, so do you feel, and, and we love the work of Project Right, but do you feel that that partnership is sufficient or the resources invested are sustainable to meet the capacity of need, specifically for youth in the Grove Hall area? And if not, what would you need, and what would that look like? So I think one of the things um, when we when we started thinking about um, looking at Grove Hall was um, there was a, a um, I think a, a clear need that um, from in terms of what we saw in terms of data and um, you know seniors were looking for a place to go as well. And the one thing that we we noticed that because of its location um, being in a school where um, it gets a lot of use um, mm -hmm. from, from um, scholastic mm -hmm. um, usage. The access for young people was limited. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we, we transitioned to um, the um, uh, senior center. But I think there's, a, you know, there's an opportunity for us to really think about, you know, s some structure okay. up in the Grove Hall community okay. at oh, some oh, point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a second. Um, and, and I do appreciate we've been, you know, banging the drum for a while about not only a diversification of teen programming that is skewed towards older youth, but also, um, uh, you know, maybe some gender specific uh, programming. So I want to do a shout out to Erica Butler, uh, who does an incredible, uh, I'm completely unbiased, but she does uh, <laughs> an, an incredible job as, as a champion of our, our girls' uh, leadership core and, you know, all the girls' programming. But the senior piece, I mean, we hear from all of our elders. I mean, they wish there was a center, and we've had this debate for a long time because what would be a central location? Then we have debates about which neighborhood has the highest concentration of seniors, right? And so you try duking it out between West Roxbury and Mattapan. You don't want to be in that room. So <laughs> Um, so I'm glad to see that um, there's a commitment to expand and to have accessible programming in these centers since, um, you know, it will allow us to have a broader reach. I do still think at some point we'll have to revisit an actual dedicated senior center, you know, one or two, but appreciate that commitment. Um, uh, just giving around, just given the extended hours, I was just curious, do we currently provide any ESOL um, uh, programming within our BCYS centers? Anything, yeah. okay. And could you speak to that? What is the capacity of that program? Do we know what its, what its reach is? How many, who's our community partner? That kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so um, we have a, a ESOL, ESOL um, program over at the um, Cleveland um, Community Center, which will be transitioning to the Marshall. Um, and it's actually uh, a, a well-attended uh, ESL, ESOL program. But we also have, I believe, six partnerships, six council partnerships, Michael? Yeah. I believe it's six council partnerships. So they're not actually um, BCYF run, okay. but they're council run ESL, ESOL programs. Okay, the site councils? Yeah, site councils. Okay, and do we know where those are? Um, I, yeah. I, uh, you, can, you can get it yeah, back. No, 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 we got it right here. Right uh, the Quincy Community Center in Chinatown, the Blackstone Community Center in the South End, uh, the Harborside in East Boston, the Jackson Man in Alston Brighton, and uh, the, as Chris had mentioned, Cleveland Perkins, and also at uh, in Jamaica Plain, they're offered also. Okay, so then yeah, I guess I'll just look for the neighborhood. So East Boston, Brighton, 
South Boston, Chinatown, Jamaica Plain? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't have it here, we'd love to know, again, what's the reach of that program? Because we all saw um, in the Globe series that sadly reported that we're, you know, last in the country in terms of Latino outcomes. And, and what's contributing to that is a 16,000 person wait list for ESOL classes. So just want to make sure that we're continuing to be deliberate about uh, making access to those free, that free programming. Um, you know, so if you guys have a sense of just how, how big that is, that would be great. And then uh, uh, I thank the chair for her indulgence here. Um, uh, so for this, this round, just two quick things. Um, we have received some calls from youth who've been employed at BCYF who have expressed grievances about not getting paid in a timely manner. I'm hoping those are anomalies and that's not a system-wide challenge. Could you speak to that? Um. From summer jobs or, or things like that. Yeah, when is that hearing coming up next? Yeah, I think that uh, I mean Rashad Cope, who's the director of that, the hearing's right after this one. Okay, I don't know if I'll you want to maybe want to save that question so that we're not. Great. And so then my final question then for this round, and it, it really will be, <laughs> is um, can you spell out in greater detail how the two hundred eighty-four thousand dollars dedicated to neighborhood trauma teams, how that will be used? I think that's. Should I ask that That's, in the next hearing too? You said two hundred eighty-four dollars to, to towards trauma teams. Yeah, the neighborhood trauma teams. I saw that line item. Did that, I miss I don't think that's ours. Is that, that BPHC? Oh, okay. Just yeah. Sure get clarity. I I've yeah. merged my questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We, I thought there was some partnership with the centers. So. We've been working um, closely with them around it, but it's okay. not in our budget. It's not in your budget. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Um, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good, morning. good to see everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go to page 11. There's the department history page here, starting with personnel, um, permanent employees. How many permanent employees of BCYF? I think we're around 380, give or take. 380 and some change. All right, uh, so emergency employees. What's an emergency employee? Uh, emergency employees are usually the seasonal employees, lifeguards, Camp Joy, things like uh, non-permanent. Um, staff. Right, and they probably make up about a quarter of overall employees. So is that in addition to the 380? Yes. So we have 380 permanent, and in addition, we have how many seasonal? Uh, I don't have that number on the at the tip of my fingers, but um, I know it's you know there's a hundred, there's it's several hundred, maybe a thousand employees for the seasonal, seasonal employee. emergency okay. employees. Okay. I just saw emergency employees and didn't know whether what that stood for. And then look at the overtime budget. What, what, would, what would require overtime, given that we're almost seven days a week? Um, who would be getting overtime? What would be the purpose for overtime? Um, almost com a, a large majority of it's lifeguards. Um, lifeguard calls out sick, lifeguard takes a vacation. Um, we have to make sure that we're properly staffed uh, sufficiently. And also uh, facilities, uh, emergency call outs, uh, snow removal, facility repairs, um, those are probably the top reasons for overtime. All right. So our seasonal employees are about a quarter of the overall employee budget and also potentially cause for the overtime stuff. So I just to recommend tightening that up a little bit if we have to put some additional lifeguards on to cut down on the overtime and or um, mm -hmm. the overall over, overtime expenditures. Communications bumped down to one, $340,000. What would set for newspaper pamphlets and flyers and what, what type of communications going on or is that or is that our communication employee or employees no it's not an, it's not an employee it's exactly what you talked about printing services uh, things like that okay that looks like it's kind of heavy uh, if we can dial in on that transportation of person so are we transporting um, children to the centers or is it when we got a summer camp and we're taking them to a ball game or going to a, a park or a beach or most of the most of that transportation centers around uh, Camp, Camp Joy, Joy in uh, Camp summertime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They have door-to-door -door transportation, so that gets costly. Okay. Um, but that's what that is. So would it make sense to leave from the community center, get all the kids to the community center, and then we transport them from the community center? So you see, we're going around picking all these kids up at their respective homes, like as if they're going to school. Yes. Yeah, the the um the regs the specialized um regs for um the the the, the population that we're serving okay. so we have to have um the um specialized uh, transportation for them got it 
And then the contracted services at 1.8, can you give me a sample of what those contracted services are? Yep. Uh, Line con item 52900. Yep, contracted services is, is a bunch of different things. There's some uh, external grants that go into that. There's repairs, there's maintenance. Um, there's any really pretty much any contract or service that we have within our department to service the community centers falls into that line item, line item as well as, like I said, um, there's several uh, grants also that we give out that's part of that. Okay. Then bump down to legal liability. So it says 4,600, but I know it was just a, a, a matter that just was resolved. So is that matter coming out of BCYF budget? Where is that execution of courts coming out of? Uh, we, I have to get back to you on that one. I'm not exactly sure where those funds, uh, if it hits our, if I hits, I don't believe it hits our operating budget. Okay. Yeah, I just want to know where that, mm -hmm. where that hits. So that would be an execution of courts. So arguably, that would be under legal liabilities. But your budget says 4,600 bucks um, for legal liability. So, okay. And just shifting over to capital, if you could just run me through this, you have status. So you have in construction, which I think is pretty self-explanatory, mm -hmm. to be scheduled, not sure what that means, new project, study underway, not sure what study underway means, um, and implementation underway. So, And then you have a whole series of citywide ones that total, I think, um, 1 million, 2 million, two, about $2.6 million, but it's kind of loosey-goosey, not really that specific. Year, you got youth budget round one, youth budget round two, youth budget round three, youth budget round five, youth budget round six, and then a later one, youth budget round four, totaling around 2.6 million, but it's just, we need a little bit more specifics on that. Yeah, so um, like you said, like you said, Council, in construction, obviously, it's currently being renovated. It's, you know, shovels on the ground, work's being done. Uh, to be scheduled means that the money's been allocated. It's with public facilities. Public facilities assigns a project manager. Public facilities will then work with us to do design selection. Um, so to be scheduled, it means exactly that, waiting just from public facilities to schedule the um, designer selection meetings and things. To, that's usually the first step is designer selection. So they assign a project manager. That's kind of what it means to say to be scheduled. New project means it was just added to the budget as a, as a new addition. So it's, it's new to the capital budget for us. Um, study underway, um, the North End, there was a study to, to programming study that was done. It's underway, we're at the final kind of stages of that, uh, identifying different locations of where a possible new uh, community center of the North End could sit. Um, but again, I think, uh, and then like you said, implementation underway, youth budget means projects have been voted on, money's there. Um, they're just waiting for departments or um, departments to spend the actual money on the project that were voted on by the youth. Uh, and I think, and then in design obviously is, we've already done designer selection, we have a designer and they're working through the design process. Gotcha, so if you go to the uh, clarity pool, so that's to be scheduled, but no authorization and no expenditure. So if your child goes to the clarity pool, what if any expectation do you have that that pool is going to be in good working order, functioning, and or when. So it says to be scheduled, but there's no there's no authorization or expenditure. So if I'm reading that, I'm like, clarity pools, that's just, that might be three, four, five years down the road. There's nothing, there's nothing backing it up, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, and again, this is just, so this these expenditures uh, for just FY19, there are spending amounts further out in the five-year plan, but clarity pool more specifically, we're doing some um, temporary repairs uh, there prior to this summer to get us through one more summer at Clarity Pool and then ultimately having a conversation with the budget office and public facilities on getting that facility addressed uh, with regards to a capital project following this summer. So then we'll see an authorization and expenditure for Clarity Pool when? This time next year? Between e now and then? Yes, yeah, so I would say the authorization would fall within uh, probably most likely FY, early FY20. Right. Uh, and then with respect to the, all the citywides, there's just no, it's not, there's no specific neighborhood, there's no specific program, there's no specific community center, it's just, it's just kind of broad-based citywide BCYF and it's to the tune of 2.6 million. Yeah, from my perspective, I, I can't, that's too loose for me, I, I need, we need to, we need to dial in on that thing. Okay. Yeah, and I guess citywide for the youth budgeting is that that money can be spent in is spent in a number of different neighborhoods is why I think they labeled it citywide and it's spent it's open to be spent in any part of the city. Right. When will we have more specific as to where it's going to be spent? Um, we could again following this. I know that 
Department of Youth Engagement and Employment has a hearing after this and they can give a more detailed list of projects that have been uh, chosen and what those neighborhoods are. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get that. that. That has to be tighter for me to support mm -hmm. this one. Um, and then uh, street worker program, just to take this opportunity to renew my call um, for one male, one female street worker program in our schools, grade seven through 12, uh, first line of defense. Uh, kids, when there's an issue going on or there's something percolating, they're less inclined to tell the teacher, they're less inclined to tell the principal, they're less inclined to go to a Boston police officer. However, and Chris, you can speak to this because you had a front row seat as one of our very first uh, street worker program leaders was that they'll go to a street worker and oftentimes they're able to stave off uh, that violence uh, at the school site before it trickles out to the train station or to the schoolyard. So um, I think it's they're, they're, they add tremendous value and I think of paramount importance that we as BCOA have put pressure on BPS to allow access to one male, one female street worker uh, for our schools that are in the, the 7 through 12 category. Uh, also, um, we as Council McCarthy had mentioned we sort of have this partnership where our, our community centers were allowed to, um, I don't know if we rent them out, if you will. So in a couple of years ago, we had an issue where um, some of our BCYF participants weren't able to use the facilities because they were being rented out. So what's the status of sort of, sort of those public-private partnerships and um, have they expanded and or have we kind of carved out so that uh, folks that are using the facilities uh, get a chance to use them during those optimum hours and then if there's uh, a lack, then we could turn around and, and, and lease or rent them out. Um, Councilor, thank you. And, and, and uh, just uh, to your point a, a second ago, um, that's certainly something that we'll, we'll, we'll keep into consideration as we think about, um, you know, moving forward with the uh, street worker program. Um, you know, as we, you know, think about the partnerships, you know, we have a, um, a, a partnership agreement that exists, and I think one of the things that will happen as we um, dot our I's and cross our T's on the um, the the, the, the MOU with our site councils is that'll be clearly clearly defined as well because um, one of the things that we we believe in as you do is that um, offerings should be available for program participants and um, rental should not impact those their ability to get in inside our community centers and and so we've been really working on on on, on that around accountability and making sure that um, our site councils and 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 um, administrative coordinators are adhering to the, the um, rules and regulations as far as the partnership agreement is concerned. Okay, and then as far as uh, employees, which what percentage of the employees in terms of their their unionized so that there's when there's openings they kind of gravitate into a listing versus the director of the community center or the leader gets to select someone that's critical for, for that community. And the issue I have is that community centers are community based and you want to make sure that we have employees that actually know the kids, know the families, know the community. And so I guess what percentage, uh, almost like, like in schools, at school site autonomy, where the principal gets to help select the teachers, how much autonomy is given to the site directors uh, to, I guess, a Bill Parcells expression, to pick the groceries? In terms of hiring. Yes, correct. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, the site coordinator, the administrative coordinator is, a, is an integral part, an important piece of, of making those decisions, um, but not the only deciding factor. Uh, there's uh, human resources folks involved, there's central office folks involved um, to help kind of oversee that process so that not only is the site hiring people they need, but also a citywide lens is put onto that with regards to hiring. Um, we don't want, um, you know, sites, there's different, different factors that may come into play and things like that, so we don't want you know, the decision to be solely made by by one person. It's more of a team approach with regards to hiring folks. Um, obviously, yes, a large majority of the positions are union. Um, and when it comes to, you know, transfers and things like that, it's pretty spelled out in black and white. But when it comes to hiring new employees, obviously the department has, uh, has the option of hiring who it is they feel is most, uh, most fit for that position and not necessarily just, it, the only option is an internal folks. It's it could be external applicants at that point also. Okay, and then just lastly, um, a lot of our sites have site councils. Um, I think there's been some changes recently, so so if you're, and I, and I served years ago uh, on the Tynan Community Council, so I guess what is the role of site councils? Um, what if any input do they have with respect to the actual facility, the running of the facility, the maintenance of the facility, fundraising around the facility, and or programming around the facility uh, moving forward? 
So if you're a member of a site council, what are your expectations as to your role with respect to BCYF programming, you know, site issues, mm -hmm. fundraising, et cetera? Yeah, I think that uh, currently what we're doing now is with the MOUs is to hopefully bring them, uh, bring a document before us that allow us to have an agreement on how we're going to work with each other. And hopefully in that how, we're going to figure out what is the best sort of goals, share goals we can have, shared outcomes and metrics that put in place that really hopefully measure each other's performance and making sure that we can do the best that we can for the constituents that come through those doors. And so I think that that's going to continue to, 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 uh, to happen. We're hoping that it, with the MOU, it also deepen our relationships with the council in a way that haven't been, that, that haven't been existent in years past. And so I don't see too much of th too many things changing, as long as we are working towards the same mutual goals that we would discuss um, uh, beforehand, and, and allow us to continue to make sure that the centers uh, continue to flourish and be a beacon of hope for the community for the constituents that come through it. So, and like everything else, I think the, the, a newness around that creates some anxiety, whether it's the the communication, the delivery of, of that. So there's obviously an expectation that people want to be involved, they want yep. a partner. Uh, they're doing some great things. They realize and recognize the value. Yep. Our community centers, uh, you know, for, for many of our neighborhoods, look very much like our community health centers and our schools. They're the, they're the lifeline of, of, of families and, uh, and mm -hmm. engagement. So from that perspective, whenever there's any type of change, uh, oftentimes yep. it's how it's rolled out and or um, just need to include folks in the process. So I know there's some concerns, particularly around sites that have had success raising uh, significant funds yeah. that they hope would go right back to that particular center as opposed to having it go into this sort of a central pot, if you will. Uh, all that will do, that will just dissuade involvement and mm -hmm. dissuade people from writing a check. And we want to yeah. make sure that we're running on all cylinders here for our local community centers. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Sabi George, and uh, thank you guys for being here and all that you do. I know it's not easy work. Um, many of my questions have been asked and answered, but just to follow up on a couple of um, requests, the list for the, this was uh, following up on Council Presley's point, um, on the community centers that are most used and those that are not, can we just, can that be forwarded to the committee so we can see it? Um, yes. In addition, uh, there was... There was another sort of information request. Um, oh, Councilor Flaherty's point. Just on the capital projects, it is a little confusing. I was looking at that too, so you don't necessarily know when something might happen. So if there can be some sort of timeline attached to this, even if it's going into the next fiscal year, would be really helpful because people sure. see this, they ask us questions and we often don't know. So I don't know if it's going through and redoing this chart and adding either what it means or a timeline around what this means um, in terms of when it will happen would be very helpful as well. Um, in terms of the public-private partnerships, the councils, the MOUs, it was my understanding that there are going to be some shifts in um, looking at those MOUs, doing something different with those MOUs. Can you talk through what that might mean? I thought it would be more substantive than previously just discussed with Councilor Flaherty. Yeah, uh, uh, majority of the MOUs mm -hmm. really speak to a lot of legalities and understanding of liabilities that are connected to it. One that speaks to, one, to insurances, right? Because those who have sat on boards know that some independent 501c3 carry their own insurances just to protect them and protect their members of the council. Um, so you'll have director insurance that'll be a part of it and then probably some general liability just to the fact that uh, we just want to make sure that they insure when they use our space. It's nothing different that we ask some other community partners. If the Y came in and wanted to use our basketball court, we may ask them, you know, hey, you know, we know that they're insured. You might write us, in, write us into your insurance plan for that day kind of piece. Uh, you know, another bucket will be reporting, right? Because the one thing we want to do is make sure that they're doing what they have to do to, in regards to meeting the um, uh, their reporting mechanisms, make sure that they're doing their filings, their financials, that they're uh, that they themselves are maintaining their 501c3 status up to par um, just for whatever purposes. There have been times where someone's made a contribution to a council and then they're calling my office for a receipt. <laughs> and so it's just having a little bit more clarity in regards to those filings. And then the last piece um, that's, that's, encumber, that, that's a part of this process is this, pro this thing about fees related to our buildings, the rental fees and the membership fees. Um, and you know we've had discussions with those, but these are fees that will be actually now collected through the city of Boston and then reinvested back into the centers. 
um, in, in Porte, and where we've had some really positive conversations in regards to it with the with the councils. Um, just meaning, you know, it, it's really sort of a way to have really clarity about how things are going to continue to operate, but just the expectations, just to make sure that they're doing everything to protect themselves, they're doing everything to hopefully protect us, we're doing everything to protect them, but at the end of the day is to make sure that we're protecting the families who are coming um, into our buildings together and, and doing the programming um, mutually beneficial. Um, how do you strike a balance with those councils that have more active participation, maybe even training around fundraising, yeah. can go out and get the resources, leverage their relationships um, to bring in more resources to a, a center versus um, another center that does not have that network, that social connectivity, yeah. those relationships? Um, in the discussions with MOUs and other things, is it going to also address some of that, um, frankly, imbalance? Yeah, I mean, part of the, the goal is that the fact that we're gonna be transparent with each other, we can actually see the picture. We can see where the lack of resources exist and which ones are resource rich, right? Um, but at the same time, hopefully to look at how do we build up those councils to actually come up to that, to, to that capacity and where they themselves can be strong. I think that there has been missed opportunities to bring councils together in a way that they can discuss each other's best practices on how they do that and kind of hopefully do some kind of cross training on how they might be able to sort of um, look at those areas that you just mentioned. But I think what it does for the very first time, it allows us to really see a really painted picture and not one that's been up here in, in the clouds about you know, who has more and who doesn't have, who has less, but really to really paint a picture about who they are and where we can ourselves support them in their own growth and in supporting the growth, the, the work together. So hopefully it would be more of a question that I think that when we see what we got, we can see where, where we can do the most work because we're really looking to make sure that equity is really across all our centers and that's gonna be the big, the big part and the, and the MOU gives us that big first step in seeing that, that, that clearer, much clearer. Uh, and what's the timeline around the review of the MOUs, um, sure. uh, redrafting things, talking yeah. through next steps? Yep, so currently what we've done in the last uh, couple of weeks, both Chief Martinez and I, we've actually done a lot of round robins, sat down with a lot of the council chairs or full council boards to discuss a little bit about the MOU. They provided us some feedback about some of the language and, and where we can make some, some, some modest changes, but nothing substantive has changed too much about it. I think they've welcomed it a lot. We still have a few more that we have to follow up, and then we have a follow-up meeting this week with the mayor to kind of discuss it a little bit, uh, a little bit more. But our hopes is to hopefully have the MOU sort of sign and in place hopefully by this summer. Uh, early summer, hopefully, prefer uh, preferably, um, and then you know, and and, and and hopefully begin to hopefully then roll out the other processes that that, that we need to roll out um, to bring it to its full fruition by hopefully the fall. So, um, no, thank you for that, and, sure. and looking forward to staying in contact because, as you can imagine, people yep. um, reach out to us and ask us about different mm -hmm. things and. and being informed is always helpful. Um, I have a, a couple of questions, um, in additional, additional questions that weren't mm -hmm. asked. Um, one is um, the Shannon Grant, there's a line item where you guys get resources from the Shannon Grant. Yes. How is that used currently? So um, um, the Shannon funding, um, we receive um, um, some funding for our girls leadership program. Um, and um, we provide some em um, employment opportunities for for um, some young people as well as um, some leadership development opportunities. Just the other day, we had a uh, girls' leadership summit, um, and I got to tell you, it was um, amazing. <laughs> um, was this led by Erica? Yes, oh, okay. uh, this past Saturday. And, Thank um, you, Erica. <laughs> it was just a phenomenal <laughs> girls' leadership. Thanks, yeah. Um, program, but we, it's a year round opportunity that, that we have, but we also um, have some funding that, um, for um, youth in our, um, in our street worker program so that we're able to provide um, access to employment opportunities, whether it's at um, one of our community centers or one of um, our nonprofits. Um, and we do some leadership development as well through um, that Shannon funding. And the, speaking of the street worker program, um, what's you know, looking at where it was sort of tweaked, changed, what, what have you seen um, as to where it is now, where it was? 
So we're still in the process of um, mm -hmm. um, what that may look like, um, but one of the things that um, we, we feel um, as we we're continuing to, to, to really um, um, put it in place is ensuring that there's one adequate amount of staff on the ground that will enable us to, to connect with um, youth and young adults in a healthy way across the city. Um, but also, um, the, I think the additional layer is adding um, that those additional supports around accountability, as well as um, um, some, some what we call um, 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 service um, coordinators to mm -hmm. provide some of the wraparound services that many of the young men and women that our street workers are working with um, may need. And when do you anticipate, Chris, um, some of those new accountability measure, metrics and um, any other tweaks that you guys think are appropriate for the program to be in place? Sure. Um, so we're, we're, we're still um, having some conversations. We, 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 um, but I, I believe that um, probably as early as um, the, 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 the beginning of the um, uh, fiscal year, we should be ready to start to um, see some of the fruition to the conversations. I think there's a little more work that needs to be done. Um, thank you for that. Also, thank you for the work around the Galavan and the Marshall um, and some of the feedback on the extended hours. Um, lastly, and I know this has been asked, and I know Mike is here, and I think he'll probably speak at some point, just related to Grove Hall. I mean, we obviously interact with many folks in that community. I do know seniors are very happy the last budget hearing we had seniors showed up and testified mm -hmm. about the program, um, the programming offered at the Grove Hall Community Center and what it meant to them. Um, and then of course, the question becomes what happens to the young people, particularly in the evenings or on the weekends. Um, and, and looking at whether it's the Burke or other places where not only can there be physical space, but what the programming itself can look like for young people. Um, so right now, BCYF has a partnership with Project Right are there other partnerships that exist with the city and someone else to, to meet the needs of those young people? Or is that still ongoing in terms of In finding, Grove Hall, you mean? In Grove Hall specifically. Um, no, um, we've, we've um, worked closely with our, our BCYF Holland and the, and the, the um, BCYF Holland Site Council to support um, the program in, in Grove Hall. And looking at trying to find more programming that can go closer to Grove Hall has been a challenge. I mean, I know, Chris, you said it's not dedicated. How do we get around that? So, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's obviously it's a conversation that, that we need to have, right? But I think, um, you know, we have to look at the assets that are in place right now. And so, you know, I know currently, you know, as, as I said, you know, we have to work around um, BPS because we, as I'd like to say, you know, we're guests in their space right now. And, um, you know, as we um, looked at the, the usage of that building, oftentimes it was just, even for us, very difficult to get in there because they were doing scholastic programs and, 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 and activities, you know, mm -hmm. and that's understandable. And so, you know, we just have to be a little bit creative around, you know, how we utilize that space as it exists now. But I know, you know, that maybe there's a, you know, opportunity, to, and I, who am I to put it out there? But as a citizen, maybe they should think about a feasibility study for a standalone over there. I don't know. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. No, I think that's a, a conversation that, that needs to be had. But um, thank you guys for the work you do. And uh, thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Thank Councillor you. Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, can you give us a rundown on the Curley Recreation Center? I know there's um, proposed funding for it, um, but give us an idea of what's taking place now and what's going to happen over the next six months, 12 months, and what phase are we in? Sure, I'll, I'll defer to, to Mike, but I think that we're going to go through a phase of investment now that we'll really hopefully begin to look at design work and looking at what could be the scope, but I, you can elaborate a little bit. Are we in the design phase now? No. Yeah, yeah, so Councilor, we're currently, we just had a meeting, obviously the $15 million has been put into the five-year capital plan. Um, it, the mayor obviously fast-tracked it. I mean, you go back two years ago, it wasn't even in the capital project. So the fact that it's in and also got priority to get um, placed in so 
the front end of the five-year plan. And also, we did have public facilities runs and helps us operate all of our capital projects because we don't have the means to do so. Um, so we did have a couple, I think it was probably two or three months ago, we had what was called the designer selection review. Um, so all the bids had been received for designers and architects that wanted to do the project. Um, we did select a designer and they are in negotiations, public facilities and the uh, designer who was selected to negotiate the contract. So we're not, we're not in design quite yet, but once the contract is finalized um, with the designer, we'll go right into design. Um, so I'm hoping we'll be in design within the next, uh, you know, in, in the near future, absolutely. Um, and then design typically takes probably a year, year or so as the design process. And in the meantime, could I possibly get a walking tour of the facility and someone point out exactly what's going to take place um, at the Curly? Yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. Anytime we can definitely arrange for you to get a walkthrough. Um, I think, you know, some basic scope of work has been identified, um, but as the designer gets underway, I'm sure a lot more <laughs> specifics will be um, spelled out with regards to the exact work that's going to be done, but we can absolutely do a tour with you anytime and, and go over some of the things that, the larger items that we see as uh, improvements. In terms of programming and services, what's happening at the Tynan in the Condon? Anything unique that you guys want to pinpoint or um, highlight? So um, at the Condon, um, you know, I, I think one of the great things that has taken place recently is that we've had an additional day, so it's now a six-day site, which I think has been really good um, for that community. Is the um, swimming pool? The, the entire yeah. um, facility is, is, is open now on Saturdays, which I think has um, is, is, is just been you know, godsend for that community. Um, they've got some really good staff over there, some really solid uh, youth workers who, who work really hard in the community and have um, real familiarity with that with that neighborhood. Um, the folks over at the Tynan, um, you know, they have an additional youth worker over there as well. And, um, you know, John and his team have been doing a really good job in terms of providing quality opportunities for, for young people, but they recently did it, uh, uh, an event um, where they took some young people out to, um, to, 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 um, and I'm going to forget the name of, of the, um, oh boy, that's terrible. They went to a theater, but you know, one of the great things about the city is having access to the theater, mm -hmm. but a lot of young people don't get to take part in it. Right. And so, um, they were able to take some young people to, to the theater, um, just recently from, from the time. And, and I just think that they've really, um, raised their game over at the Tynan and the Condon in terms of providing quality opportunities for teenagers, um, which, um, you know, as we think about some of the challenges that, you know, South Boston has seen recently, I think it's going to be really um, important to, you know, as, as they've seen some increases, especially in the um, West Broadway, D Street um, housing development. So um, we want to continue to support um, those efforts there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to visit on Saturday the Tobin Community Center, and I saw BCYF um, hosting with the mayor's office a basketball game with the Boston police. It went over very well. Um, it's great that you guys are doing programs like that, bringing young people together with the police. So I just want to highlight that as well. Um, what, what's happening with Josiah Quincy? Any, any program cuts at all to the, to the center? No, no, there's there's no cuts there. Um, you know, they've been down a um, youth worker recently. Um, I think we're in the process of of um, that hiring process for the youth worker. But um, you know, the Josiah Quincy is a is, is a well run community center. Helen um, Wong does a really good job down there, and um, you know, we think that um, it's one of um, um, you know, and our network is one of our stronger um, programmatically run um, spaces. Yeah, I'm down that facility at least once a week, and they are, they are doing a good job. Um, I just want to highlight a couple things. The, the number of personnel you have, BCYF. I'm, I'm looking at the numbers, Asian, 2% of um, personnel is Asian. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Is, that, is that where you want to be? No. I mean. how, could we, how could we improve that number? 
Well, I, th I think one of the things, you know, as we think about, you know, the city generally speaking, I think, you know, we, we're certainly um, striving to be um, as diverse as the city is. And we're not there yet, but we certainly um, want to get there. And we'll continue to, to, you know, engage external and partners to, to help us with that. Um, certainly, um, you know, the population's growing. You know, Boston is, is, is increasingly more diverse. And um, we want to make sure that um, our department reflects that. So um, we certainly know that um, we can't do that alone. We have to partner with a lot of the external agencies, um, the, the stakeholders in the neighborhoods who know the people. And I think um, it also speaks to, I think what the council, um, council Fowley raised earlier, which is how do we work with the local folks, the folks on the local level to ensure that they're helping us identify folks from those respective um, communities that can help provide the quality outcome driven services that we look for. And I can certainly help on that regard as well. I'm in Chinatown every, every day, uh, but I would like to see that number increased. 2% uh, does seem low. Um, also, we have a growing Vietnamese community, especially in, especially in Dorchester. It's not my district, but I, I, I think we need more Vietnamese speaking uh, personnel there as well. Your point's well taken. Well put, yeah. And not to, not to continue on that subject, but I'll, I'll just add one more thing um, about it. The top salaries of BCYF, um, there should be, you know, there's 28, 28 top managers, it seems. At least one of them should be Asian, in my opinion. So maybe we can look at that again and um, over the next six months, you know, do do some more recruiting, bring some people on board, but I think I think we need some senior leaders from the Asian community um, at BCYF as well. Do you guys agree? Yep. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. How many street worker street workers are there in the city? So um, currently, there's uh, 30, 30, 28 street workers. Um, four senior street workers and um, 15 violence interrupters on um, that are 15 violence interrupters, but there are seven <coughs> who are actually on payroll. How many are on payroll? Seven violence interrupters, so there's seven okay. positions that are open. Okay. There's a total of 47. Okay. In can you give me an idea of what's taking place at the Blackstone? I know it's open on Saturdays also from 9 to 5. I think that's a great, great addition, this pool and the gym. Um, what other type of outreach are we doing in Blackstone, considering that it's kind of in the middle, middle of uh, Villa Victoria and the cathedral? Are we doing enough for people in BHA? As yeah, well. yeah, we've got you know we've got some some pretty good staff on the ground um, that are doing some real intentional outreach in you know Cathedral and Eber and Lenox. Um, you know we we, we um, you know provide access to to the space whether we're going out to walk them over or bring the van over. Um, but we also have um, you know as you know the South End is a very diverse community. And um, you know it, it's 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 great when you walk into the um, Blackstone Community Center because you see that diversity play out. Um, there's um, you know we've got some youth workers over there, two really good um, youth workers who do some 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 real um, creative um, um, work um, there. And, um, you know they've got a great um, youth ventures team over there uh, that are doing some some really cool stuff. I think one of the things they're doing is. Um, um, one of the teams are doing a cell phone repair program, which is pretty pretty awesome. And um, you know, I just think that um, it's an opportunity for us. With our, as we you know have our family gym over there, you know, we've got some families who will, probably would not come into um, BCYF space um, any other time, and they're over there on a daily on a, on Saturdays. You go over there, that gym is packed with with those families. Um, you know, we've got a fitness center in partnership with BU at the Blackstone that, that, that's quite busy. It's actually a very nice um, fitness center. So, you know, there's some, some, some really good work that's taking place over there. But, you know, we certainly um, want to get stronger and we have to continue to partner with um, 
um, that community and those external partners to, to, to provide those quality opportunities around the clock. I'm just looking at one of the um, brochures on the, um, that you provided, department history, current, I can't read it all that closely. Um, it's the fourth paragraph down, but it basically says aid to veterans. It's on the second page. The first page is Committee on Ways and Means, FY19 budget hearing. Then the second page, Department History. Then, then four paragraphs down or four blocks down. It said uh, it has aid to veterans. Oh, yes. Line item 54. Yeah. Yep, I see it, Counselor. Can you explain that to me? It, it's, I'm pretty sure it says zero, right? <laughs> Yes. I don't know if that was just mistakenly put in there. I don't believe that's a regular line item for us. Um, I don't. We don't. We, I don't think we've ever had any money budgeted there. I don't know why that's showing there. To be honest with you, was there ever a program BCYF helping veterans? Not that I'm aware of. So is it is it more of a typo that the words aid to veterans are in there? I'm thinking it is. Yes. If that's different, if there was funding in the past, could could you guys let me know? Absolutely. And maybe it is something to consider down the road if there is a opportunity to help veterans in any BCYF facilities, I think it would go over well. I know the mayor has done an excellent job of helping homeless veterans um, get housing, and he's working closely with a lot of veteran service organizations across the city, across the state as well. But I think if you guys are able to long-term consider what options you might have for veterans in military families, I think it would, I think it would go over well. Noted. But, you know, at the same time, when you're talking about the veterans, when you think of the Thank the Vet uh, initiative that uh, Commissioner Sterling kind of implements, a lot of them kick off at RBCYF centers. I mean, that's where they gather. That's where they, they do a lot of the work. Uh, the fact that we're on the same cabinet doesn't mean that we haven't been exploring opportunities that we could kind of work together. Um, you know, Giselle has some great ideas. I have some great ideas about um, during the times that some of our sites are underutilized, how do we create the sort of the, the bugle league, meaning that there'd be an opportunity for servicemen and women to have basketball leagues or have indoor soccer leagues or whatever it may be that they may, they may want to do. Um, at the same time, she's been a very visible partner in a lot of our block parties and a lot of our community events, a, putting a table out, informing them of, about the opportunities, but at the same time, promoting our own BCYF facilities as opportunities for them to get their health, recreation, and child care needs to as well. So I think that um, under the leadership of Chief Martinez, one of the things that I know he wants to do is to better coordinate his own cabinet to look at how do we make each other's spaces and each other's programs part of our, uh, part of our, our thread of, of offerings um, together. Yeah, I had the opportunity to attend many of the Thank a Veterans um, events, and they went over very well, very helpful to our returning veterans and our older veterans as well, mm -hmm. military families. So, you know, thank you to the mayor for always being there for our military families. I think that's, his, I think that's um, a great accomplishment this administration has made. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Janey. Um, thank you again, and just to, um, kind of echo the importance of diversity. I um, had an earlier question. I really appreciate Councilor Flynn's uh, questions. Um, certainly agree that the uh, staff, in terms of city employees, should reflect the diversity of our city as well as private. Um, would love to see more diversity uh, in our centers. Um, it's great to see you guys here as uh, as commissioner, as deputy commissioner, and certainly our, our chief in the audience. Um, along those lines, earlier there was a, a question regarding the immigration information centers. Um, I can't remember who asked it, who brought it up, and uh, said that there were materials offered in various languages. What languages are actually spoken there? Um, 
you know, I can't come off the top of my head. I mean, Spanish would be obvious, okay. Vietnamese and so forth. Um, normally, a lot of that information is not something that we selected. It's something that we worked with the um, Mayor's Office of Immigration Advancement, who actually makes that selection. Um, we can get back to you about, from them, how what are the languages that are there, um, and get it back to you so that you can okay. have it. So. Um, and just quickly, one more question, I think, <laughs> um, to follow up around community engagement uh, and the equity piece. So, I don't know, maybe about a month ago, I had the opportunity to meet with residents at Alice Taylor. Mm -hmm. There is a community center in the middle of the housing development there, and the residents had expressed concern about um, not being able to utilize that space, not having access to the space, but also that the programming there was not programming that the residents were uh, encouraged to, to utilize. And I know that there's been some change since an RFP. Um, so I think, you know, that's great. That's certainly what I would like to see is mm -hmm. making sure that there's an RFP with language in it that talks about community use. Um, but I'm hoping that you can talk just more broadly about community engagement and making sure, so we've talked about Grove Hall mm -hmm. as another example. Yeah. Um, certainly want to see youth programming uh, in the Grove Hall area, I think all over our city, but that shouldn't come at the expense of senior programming. It's not an either or. We want to make sure that our young people as well as our seniors are able to utilize space, but also have that voice in terms of what kind of programming that they want to see. Can you kind of talk to me about how that happens? The community engagement pieces? Yes, community yeah. engagement, but also capturing that voice around the programming and making sure that it's something that sure. really, that the community wants to see in their area. Sure. Um, in regards to community engagement, it's something that I take very serious. Um, I tend to re represent a population, not only being Latino, but being a male that served seven years in prison that sometimes doesn't have a voice in a lot of these spaces. And so I take it really wholeheartedly. Um, I can tell you that my own personal commitment has been that I've worked remotely from sites and I'll cover a front desk, and I will push a broom, and I will move a chair, because I know that it brings me closer to getting into, into the right space with somebody who can offer me a little bit more about what our spaces could be doing. And so that's a constant, ongoing piece. Um, and I know that my deputy commissioners and my team that's up in the galleys always, always heard that one of the things that I love to make sure that BCYF continues to be is at the center of partnerships. And the way we do that is by making sure that we are not only operating within our own four walls, but looking at the four corners of our community and making sure who is in our backyard and what is it that we're doing for them and what is it that we may be able to offer them. But the best way to do that is to take the time to listen mm -hmm. at all times. And so that's going to continue to be sort of a big part of it. Um, it's like the, the, the Allison Cooper, the Johnson Center, um, the, these were consolidated sites that happened prior to this administration coming in, and since the time that we've been here, we've been trying to hopefully remedy a little bit about how their community engagement and community access to those spaces uh, could be better to make sure that they, that they are able to hopefully offer something that the community has identified as sort of as a need, um, whatever it might be. Part of us deepening our relationships with the uh, site councils is because they are people who are real foot soldiers who live in that community and have a great grasp and understanding of what that community is demanding for, what is it asking for, and to make sure that if we're in, in the capacities that we can, we're able to reflect that in the programming that we tend to offer. So that will be always my continuing commitment to make sure that there is a strong presence of, of, of community input in the programming that we do, because you know communities tend to change, and if we're not, if we're only looking at what's happening within our four walls and not looking outside of them, then we don't change with them. And then what happens is that we don't go strong, we don't, be, we don't become stronger um, by not taking that time to kind of listen and, 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 and be a part of it. And, um, and so, you know, that's my personal commitment that you will continue to have. And it's the same commitment that I asked my two deputy commissioners on the side to do, to spend some time outside, outside our administrative office and just get a really a good listen to what's happening within, within our buildings and within our communities at all times. I really appreciate that okay. um, as an organizer, yep. making sure that we're capturing community voice. Um, and I can speak personally, I, yep. I see Chris out all the time, <laughs> um, just getting to know you, but hopefully we'll see you as well. So thank you so much for that. I really yep. do appreciate that. Good. And uh, it was great just to follow up, you know, with the chief around this particular issue and to, to see that, that the concern um, was built in and that the, the engagement piece will be in this RFP. I, I really do appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you.
That's it. Thank you, Councillor Janey. Um, oh, it's my turn. Sorry. Um, I just shifting gears here. Um, just to get back to some of what we talked about uh, with the Boston Public Schools and your relationship with them. I know during the proposed bell time in December, the bell time conversation, there was a lot of attempted networking to resolve some of the after school and possibly before school work. Um, what is the relationship with some of the later end schools now and some of the after school programming that happens and is networked between BPS and you guys? Yeah, so I, I, I don't think, I mean, Council, we didn't have much uh, you know, much change in, in the way our after school programs operated this year. Um, obviously, you know, we kind of, our programs and a lot of them are offered by the, um, the site councils kind of work in hand with, with the school hours that they operate within. So if they, you know, some of them start as early as, as, as you know, two o'clock and they all pretty much pretty regularly go until six o'clock. Um, but we did work through a couple of little things with, with Boston Public Schools around some concerns that, that students and families had. And other than that, we've really operated our after school programs in a similar fashion we have in the past. I mean, being from two to six usually pretty much covers us regardless of what BPS is looking to do. I know there's some conversation around, um, and I, we do have some before school programs because that was something we don't do as much of, um, but could have been a need that could have been developed through you know some schools that would go to a later time that now parents would need an option for before school, but we've been in very close uh, conversations with the extended learning time team over BPS, and they've very much made us part of that conversation, so we can kind of work together to best uh, you know best suit the, the children that we both serve, especially in the buildings where we're in school buildings. So um, those talks were very uh, in depth and continued, but again, um, we haven't seen much any of interruption this this school year. Okay, um, and then what about your relationship with the Boston Pu Public Health Commission, especially on work around youth homelessness, both uh, younger kids and then some kids that are unaccompanied? So we've, we've, um, we've got a strong relationship with um, the, the Health Commission and um, have certainly um, supported their efforts around homelessness. And, you know, one of the things that, that you know, Last year, we had a, a number of staff who were dedicated to, to supporting the efforts around homelessness, especially in and around downtown Boston, the Commons. Um, so we worked closely with them, the Health Commission. We worked closely with um, Bridge Over Trouble Waters, as well as um, the Department of, of Neighborhood Development. And um, you know, we've, we've, we, we we certainly will continue to um, work closely with um, the Health Commission around this issue. Uh, we know how important it is to the administration, and also making sure that our spaces are available for families. Um, you know, when when they walk through our doors, they don't come through our doors and say they're homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them, um, you know, they're going to school, they're doing all the things that you would expect from a functional um, standpoint, but many of them, you know, don't know where they're going to lay their head that night. And so, you know, the relationships that they're building in our spaces are important because that's where you, you, hear, the, you hear what their needs are because they'll talk to people that they feel comfortable with. So um, we're, we're certainly um, going to continue to work um, with um, the Health Commission as well as others in addressing the issue because it's a... Um, very important issue. Right, and then I'm happy to work to connect you with some of the family shelters in the city. So when we have families that have maybe been located to a community that they're not as familiar with, for them to know that their kids can access some of the, the, the family as a whole can access some of the programming. Um, I'll make sure that I get you that list. Um, Great, thank especially you. Especially some of the scattered sites, if you know a family maybe is moving from one community to another and just not fully aware of sure. what programs are available. In, um, in some of the BPS hearings, and we had a specific one on school safety, I'm, I'm wondering about the preparedness, the BCYF, the youth centers are for any sort of active shooter event or any sort of um, incident in your centers specifically. You want to go first? Or you? Yeah, just I mean, just that. I mean, I think that you know we worked closely with, and we work closely yeah. with emergency management in a lot of different things. But one of them was that we worked with them in um, the Boston Police Department to have all of our staff trained uh, in an active shooter situations. So they all attended those trainings. BPD and emergency management made it so that they would have to offer several different trainings so our staff could all get there. But also 
part of the you know the BPS MOU that we're, we're drafting also includes making sure that PCYF is part of their training so that we're all on the same page with regards to any sort of emergency or incident that occurs within a school. Um, so we kind of come at it doing our own side of the training, um, which all of our staff have gone through, but also working, moving forward, working with BPS to make sure we're on the same kind of, uh, you know, plane they are when it comes to what their emergency operations plans are and with regards to active shooters and whatnot. Great, thank you. And then, um you know, many of our kids are facing a lot of traumatic and unsafe events or feelings from their own communities. I don't know if this was covered earlier by an earlier question, but can you talk a little bit about the training that your team receives around being trauma informed? And maybe some of the workers that aren't necessarily street workers that we know have a lot of those skills, but some of the other staff. Yeah, um, we've worked closely with the health commission um, so that not only are the street workers um, trauma-informed, trained around trauma-informed care, um, also some of our staff um, at our, our site are trained as well. Um, again, you know, um, when young people come into our spaces, you know, um, they're going to talk to people that they're most comfortable with. And sometimes in our haste and well-intentioned, um, you know, we're all well-intentioned and want to be helpful and supportive, and sometimes um, we, 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 we do harm unknowingly. And so we're trying to make sure that all of our staff have those tools to be able to um, engage young people in a way that supports them. Um, you know, trauma is something that we all experience in many different ways, and um, we certainly know um, how important it is that um, as an additional tool um, in their toolbox and uh, our staff, um, need to be um, trauma-informed trained. So um, our hope is to have every one of our staff trained around trauma-informed. But right now, um, our, all of our youth workers have been trained um, in trauma-informed care, as well as our street workers and violence interrupters, and some um, of our um, athletic directors. Great, thank you. And then um, regarding training, have, have you felt the need and has there been a need to train any of your employees and staff on proper needle disposal? We see that as a concern in BPS. We see it a concern in the Boston Public Libraries. Um, and then proper needle disposal, if any, are found uh, both on in, within your physical buildings but then also on your grounds. Yeah, so, I mean, we've, we just recently sent out um, a policy and a procedure around disposal of needles because, it, unfortunately, it is... It does happen, like you said, in schools and libraries. Any public building, unfortunately, sometimes people um, utilize them for things they shouldn't, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard to decipher when someone's going to do something like that. But um, really, our, our advice to our staff is not to handle them, um, is to call. I know the mayor's office has services available where um, folks will come and dispose of them. We tell them to call 911. Um, we don't want someone to get accidentally stuck with a needle, so we really try to... Uh, we, we sent out a policy just recently in the past uh, two or three months and have worked with the unions around how staff should should handle that incidents like that. Right. Uh, there is a mobile sharps team um, that we advise the public to use 311 to call, but I, I wonder, it might, might be, um, it might be good, especially with your pre-existing relationship with the Health Commission, um, and just maybe yeah. have a more direct pipeline so that those needles are picked up properly, or... Um, work with your staff and your unions um, and your your employees to maybe identify people on each site that are properly trained. It, it actually isn't, uh, if you are properly trained, it doesn't take much to become trained to mm -hmm. handle needles properly, but we do need to make sure that we have the, the kiosks or the, the bins, yep. the, the proper uh, biohazard bins in which to store them. So that, that might be worth a conversation. Now, all BPL libraries have them. Um, on site, you know, fast food restaurants have them on site, and um, you know, both for uh, mm -hmm. illicit drug use, but then also for any of your members that may have um, diabetes or another chronic condition where they yep, may they need do. to dispose of needles properly. Uh, that is, um, that's it for my questions, um, Councilor Presley. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it in your line of questioning. Did you ask about Narcan? I didn't. I was taking I notes. I want to make yep. sure I didn't miss it. Do, do you have Narcan on site and are appropriate uh, personnel trained in the administering of it? 
Uh, we do not have Narcan. We do host and have hosted several Narcan trainings for the community, um, for staff who want to take part in it. But at this point, um, none of our staff are trained in Narcan and none of our on site, we do not have Narcan. Okay. So any training is opt in, not mandatory? Exactly, yes, okay. at this point. And what is the access to the training? Well, like I said, a lot of the trainings, we've had multiple trainings held directly at our sites. So it's the community okay. trainings that sites offer that residents can go to, but also the staff can go to that are obviously they're held within our okay. confines. So, thank you. Um, picking back up on um, a line of questioning around partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission, um, I want to thank um, Chief Martinez and his shop for participating in my annual council briefing on the Healthy Boston Report. And one of the things that was cited regularly um, in that report was a youth risk behavior survey. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you all have access to that and are aware of the findings of that report as well, so that there are opportunities for synergy. So, for example, we found that uh, cigarette usage and binge drinking have dropped mm -hmm. considerably. Um, but we do see an increase in cannabis use. Yeah. Um, you know, teen pregnancy numbers have dropped considerably, but we see an increase in STIs and STDs. So I just wonder if there, if you all are privy to the data and if there are opportunities for uh, prevention and education with the commission and with you to um, address these disparities um, or to change the outcomes rather. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for that question. And um, yes, we, um, um, Chief Martinez actually um, hosted a presentation um, in one of the cabinet meetings. Um, well, he, he invited the health commission to, to host a, um, a um, presentation around that. And there was some really interesting f in findings, but also the opportunity to really think about the work in our spaces to support a lot of those findings. And you okay. know, um, we recently met with the Health Commission um, to really um, do some, um, some community engagement um, conversations with young people. And hopefully we're gonna embark on that journey um, this summer um, to have a series of um, community engagement conversations with youth Wonderful. and okay. in the hopes that it'll help inform um, well, please do keep some of the work. Sure. Just want to make sure we continue to engage the consumers, um, you know, our, our young people and what their needs are so that mm -hmm. the programming is, you know, grass tops up and not top down. Uh, especially on the prevention and education side. So however I can be a partner or a resource with you mm -hmm. on the Health Commission, I hope you will actively engage me either in using my social media platforms to promote things or um, to personally attend or uh, right. even to, pro to provide community forums to present this data. Um, so uh, in the vein of partnerships, uh, Councillor um, Edwards and Asabi George um, have initiated a um, a revisiting of um, how many of our colleges and universities are uh, actively taking part in pilot and uh, payment a little of taxes. And I just wonder, you know, given the great needs and how hard your, you know, your, your team and your staff work and are talking about the need to have more dedicated programming in Grove Hall and, um, you know, so many other things. Are there any colleges and universities uh, for whom you have a sustainable partnership with? Um, who are providing a benefit to community, either, I don't know, <laughs> in college <laughs> no, no, tours I mean, or programming or yeah. something. We, we, we have a few, but I think that we, it's still an area that we can continue to deepen yeah. and improve. I, I, the way I look at it, the way our centers are scattered geographically, there's an opportunity to always have a college okay. that can be married to it. But when we have relationships like BU, that does a fabulous job at the Blackstone, okay. offering a beautiful fitness center that's really not just about providing fitness, but more the, about the education, about breaking unhealthy habits and, and how exercise plays a, a role in, in, um, in combating you know, health issues, you know, hypertension, and et cetera. Absolutely. Those are some great examples. And I think we've had great partnerships in regards to getting access to colleges and campuses for youth enrichment days, uh, from, from recently at Simmons College where we had the Girls' so Summit. So we might, in, we uh, have to, at, at the discretion of the, of the yeah. chair, I don't want to speak for yeah. Chair Councillor Edwards, but I hope that we can get some of yeah. that reporting or maybe you'll come yeah. and testify at that hearing because I want to be clear, you know, we're not looking to vilify mm -hmm. folks. We want to hold them accountable. Yeah. But we also like to know who's doing the work so that if there are folks that are 
doing it well. You know, we want to lift, sure. you know, lift them up and increase the capacity of what they're doing. Um, and if by default folks that aren't stepping up get shamed a little bit yeah. and pressured, that's okay too. So, you know, please do let us uh, know. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, speaking of uh, unhealthy habits, uh, financial fitness or lack thereof is certainly one of them for many of our families. Um, I'll include myself in that. And um, uh, trying to unlearn, you know, bad behaviors and just a lack of uh, generational financial literacy and fiscal management. And so I understand that some of the programming that you're doing in your centers. So just wanted to know a little bit more about that. So we, um, we, we, we partnered recently with um, Junior Achievement um, around the, um, providing some financial literacy um, workshops with, um, with our youth. Um, and we'd love to be able to expand it to families. And so one of the things that we're going to be looking to do is um, do some financial literacy um, workshops for families. Um, they, they, the, the, the junior achievement um, workshops um, were, were well received by the young people. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, in the summertime, they um, get to earn a little bit of money. And we want to make sure that they understand you know, how to squirrel some of that money away and not spend it all. Um, and, and so um, we certainly, um, um, you know, provided those opportunities um, via Junior um, Achievement, and we hope to um, continue to do that um, next year um, with some of the um, families. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, actually two questions. Uh, for the street worker program, could you tell me the gender breakdown? There's... Um, uh, out of out of the forty seven um, staff um, right now, I believe there are forty seven ten females in that forty seven. Okay. And then um, finally, I just wanted to pick up on the uh, <laughs> MBE or MWBE contracting opportunities. Um, just trying to gauge if the mayor's executive order and the ordinance uh, authored by Councilor Wu and I and passed by this body is having an impact. And um, I see that, um, I'm not sure, page 12 by my read, uh, BCYF, it lists for contracts over $100,000. There's Boston After School and Beyond Incorporated, um, MOU, After School Initiative, and then Smart from the Start, which is an organization I love. I just want to give them a huge shout out. I'm so glad to know that, that they are a partner. Um, and that amount is for $180,000. Um, I just wanted to ask if any of these are M or WBE contracts and if this is in any way an increase from previous years. Um, so, Council, those, those are the same. I, those contracts have been running for a while. I mean, okay. the department, just we don't have, typically that's really all we have over 100000 We don't have many contracts over that amount. But um, those have been in here for at least, again, I can go back at least so seven like or eight years. So it's like a multi-year sort of relationship and contract. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. And as um, I know Councillor Flaherty is next, I just want to re remind people we do have a member for public testimony, a revolving fund hearing, and then one more hearing today. Just as trying to wrap it up. Thank you, thank, Council Fire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just on the issue around uh, the partnership around uh, substance abuse, just want to make sure we get a commitment that no community center is going to be used to allow folks to inject heroin or fentanyl. Uh, there's a movement afoot to try to find these injection sites. So just want to make sure that uh, that's a, that's a non-starter for uh, centers for youth and families. Yeah, no. Another hour, no. Okay. Um, going back to the, the line items to the permanent employees, um, if you look at the increase this year, permanent employees was 946,119. And if you look at last year's, it was 335, 228. So over the last two years, it's a 1.281347. So close to $1.3 million on personnel. Can you just explain the increase in the staffing and what areas, what community centers, who got the bump? Yeah, I think that what it is is that there's a the Condon to, and, the, and the Draper to extend them to six, uh, six day away sites are, are, are part of that, that, that math. Um, the other one is that we're also relocating from the Cleveland to the Marshall School, um, meaning that we had a, a, up a number, a couple of numbers of staff there to support um, the program needs that, that we're expecting there. Um, it, it was part of that factor. 
uh, last year we were only looking at really floating lifeguards. That was the, the, the kind of one of the, the, the biggest pieces. And I'm not sure if in that number it's also incorporating uh, the investment of the of absorbing a couple of the violence interrupters into the street worker roles mm -hmm. too as well. So a total of how many employees? That's 1.3 million. Like what's that? What's the three? I think it's around. I think it's around ten, but I'm not totally sure. Okay. Yeah. I have just, to get. Yeah, if you can just get me a uh, yeah. clear answer on that. Uh, also, if you look at docket uh, line item five four nine hundred, uh, it says other other current charges. Uh, there's a line item there for one fifty one nine hundred. What is that? Do you know, one hundred fifty one thousand nine hundred dollars. Page eleven. Five four nine zero zero. Other current charges. I can get you a breakdown on what that is, Councilman. That'd be great. Thank you. And then uh, looking at the external funds, it looks like external funds are, are, are down over 40%, so I, which is concerning. So uh, how do you plan on overcoming the decrease in the external funds? And uh, do any of these programs have to be eliminated? Uh, you see there's some big cuts to, to the Tiny Tots program, big cuts to the Street Safe program, uh, big cut to um, City Hall Child Care, big cut to community-based violence prevention, you know, or just wasn't refunded. So. What are we doing about these external fund uh, deficiencies? Yeah, we're just trying to look for. Yeah, Council, where are you? Page two. Page two. External fund budget. So, for example, City Hall Child Care was 1.3, and there's been a drop of 580,944. That's pretty significant. That's a 43.65% drop. Community-based violence prevention was not funded, so that's a minus 127, 212. Street Safe Program was 680, dropped a quarter of a million dollars, 248, 414. And then the Tiny Toss Program uh, went from 77,000, uh, took a $36,404 hit. So again, overall external funds is down over 40%. So I guess the question is how will you overcome the decrease in the external funding? And will any of those programs have to be eliminated? Uh, are they sustainable at that number? We don't anticipate um, any any loss in, in terms of um, the street safe funding. Um, as we were talking earlier, you know, um, one of the things that we've been doing um, on, under the chief's leadership is really trying to um, identify some external um, funding. Um, I think we mentioned that, you know, it was funded for three point one million dollars. We were at the end of that, that um, fund, and so that's what those numbers that, that you just mentioned are. And um, we anticipate um, being able to um, ride that out at, bit, at least through um, FY19 as far as um, that is concerned, and we're gonna continue to look at some external um, um, opportunities so that we can sustain it. All right, that's gonna be a tough ride because it's close to a million dollars. It's 995,577. So some good programs that are adding tremendous value uh, from Tiny Tots to Street Safe to community-based violence prevention to uh, City Hall Child Care. So. In council, the, the City Hall Child Care runs at a deficit. Um, we did do another 5% increase on the, on the rates for City Hall Child Care to help try to close that deficit a little bit, but that deficit always gets covered, so there's no changes in line for the City Hall Child Care Program, but again, that does historically run at a deficit. And then also the Tiny Tots Program, there's no changes foreseen with that. Um, we we support 50% of the salary for three different sites for their child, uh, for their um, preschool teachers, um, and the other 50% is reimbursed by the site councils. There's no changes seen in that. There was one retiree, um, which may account for some of the, the change there, but the same support that's been provided in the past will be provided moving forward. Okay. And then just lastly, uh, security cameras. I know there was a note that um, it was mentioned earlier that the security cameras. So I guess which sites are getting the security cameras? Are they inside, are they outside? And do they uh, just take the uh, footprint or are they expanding into the neighborhoods? Yep, so it's been a big push for us to try to improve the camera network at the community centers, you know, whether it be, you know, a theft, you know, accounting for something that happened, uh, you know, just safety in general that a, that a camera provides. We've worked very closely with Municipal Protective Services and Chief Joyce and, and his folks to get all of our cameras, not only get cameras, but have them tied back here to City Hall so that the footage can be viewed by uh, Municipal Protective Services. It can be obtained by Boston Police Department if need be, and also allows us to view them remotely. 
um, so that we can see cameras without having to physically be at the site, um, which has allowed us many instances where we've been able to either solve a theft or something or, or, or protect somebody. It, they've been very helpful, but they're also very costly, but we've gotten support um, from Office of Emergency Management with funding and also through the Budget Office being supportive of this. For the most part, we were only getting cameras as part of capital projects, but we've tried to fast track that a little bit where we've recently upgraded and installed a new system at the Roach Community Center uh, in West Roxbury. Uh, the Tobin Community Center, our central office, didn't have any cameras and is now uh, equipped with, I believe, <coughs> 16 cameras, and these are both internal and external cameras. Um, our next focus is on the Hyde Park Community Center where we're trying to work with BPD and some other partners to see if we can come up with some funding there because we do try to um, help with the exterior coverage if, if BPD or, or someone else sees a need for that. Um, also, as part of these capital projects, Parish Street was outfitted with cameras. Um, Gallivan will be outfitted with cameras. Vine Street will be outfitted with cameras. Um, so we're moving forward with that and trying to, you know, again, protect the staff, protect the, co the constituents, and really just make for a safer environment. It also helps with visibility. A lot of our buildings are on multiple floors and things like that. It helps the staff be able to see different areas of the building. So we're very keen on trying to move this forward. Um, obviously, again, um, it's just come down to sometimes budget, but we're doing more than we, we've ever done in the past with regards to some pre-existing buildings getting those stuff up and running. So. Okay. I well, appreciate your time and efforts, uh, all of you. I, I'm happy to join uh, the tour with my colleague, um, Council Flynn, with respect to the Curly Recreation. Just get a commitment that nothing's reduced to writing until we talk to the people that use the facility. Mm -hmm. We converse with the local elected officials. Sometimes we get down the design route and you have someone that might have this vision of grandeur, but they don't use the facility uh, and what they may envision mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to how it's actually operated. So so before any design comes out of, uh, comes out of the gate, I want to make sure that uh, Sure. We're briefed on, on it uh, as well as maybe having some input in, in selecting uh, who is going to be uh, designing the facility. So, so I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Can Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Uh, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. I know one of the best programs you guys administer is the Camp Joy program. Um, can you give us a little bit of background? How is that going? And um, What's what's going to anything unique that's going to happen this summer? Um, Camp Joy is is um, you know uh, under the leadership of um, Mr. Breda Smalls, who's in in, in the gallery, is a, a, a fantastic program. It's a well-run program. We see over 250 um, youth and young adults participate in that program across the city: the Orenburg, Jackson, Man, um, and Madison Park. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, um, I think we talked about earlier is that, you know, the program is, 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 it runs well. We've got good staff there. You know, the regs have changed a little bit, and so we have to take that into consideration. Um, a lot more one-to-one um, -one, um, responsibilities based on the ratios. And so taking that into account, we also want to make sure that if in order to, to attract the right staff, to, um, um, staff who, who um, you know, have the tools and skills to be able to do what we're asking them to do, that we're able to compensate them. And so we, we're really having to take a look at um, the numbers in terms of staffing and how we're able to ensure that they're compensated at a level that we can keep them, attract them and keep them. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you know, we can only keep them for four weeks. And if you know, you you know some of the, some of the most people are looking for a longer employment opportunity, especially when they're in between their their, their regular jobs. And so, that's what we're, we're I think we're, we're we're tasked with. But the um, the program itself is 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 it, it's um, we're excited about the program. Um, it's an amazing program, and um, the staff do uh, an amazing job. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I don't think we can do enough in this city for youth with special needs or, or disabilities. Um, what else is BCYF doing to help um, children with uh, special needs, disabilities throughout the year? Um, can we add more services? Can we add more programs? And if, we, if money's the issue, can we can we advocate for more funding for um, any programs that help special special needs children? Well, one of the things that we did um, 
that we have done in the last year is that we've actually pulled our administrative coordinators together because a lot of them are always challenged with this question when they have a, fa a family in front of them that has a children with a disability, what is our capacity to service them, you know? Um, and so one of the things that have come out of that is that we've looked at our language, we looked at our practices, and we've actually asked one of the ACs to actually lead a program committee to look at um, this special population and then to think about what is it that we can be doing more. And one of the things that have come out of it, there's been a series of trainings to try to train our staff a little bit more about how do you kind of address that question and how do you address working with that population. But I think that there's been an intentional practice to also make sure is how do we also find ways that we can be creative to include include children with disabilities all year round. Um, you know, if I'm mistaken, Chris, uh, Camp Joy does have a, a, a component that continues after summer. Uh, sort yeah, of a, a yeah. program that continues to winter program. a winter program that continues to re reunify the kids and the families together uh, on a weekly basis and hopefully continue to keep in touch with them to think about how do we help inform stuff but I think that where BCYF wants to be in the future is to be one that these children and these families are occupying the same spaces with the able body Mm -hmm. uh, parents too as well because the biggest challenge that sometimes children with disabilities have is actually the able bodies who have a fear of how to connect with them and how to engage them and once we can remove that factor and find the spaces to kind of do that together it'd be great I just recently was at the Paris Street where there was a child there who I believe has spina bifida with a wheelchair playing basketball with able bodied children mm -hmm. that's the more of the stuff that we want to kind of envision because there's so much that they have to offer us and there's so much that we can offer them but we have to get there collectively in doing that yeah, thank you for saying that. And if there's, if there's anything I can certainly do to help help on that issue, please let me know. I think we should have more funding in the budget mm -hmm. to help special education, uh, special needs, people with disabilities. Um, yeah. That's that's critical. Oh, it's we can't we can't do enough across it, the city for. Yep. It's very critical. Even this year in the mayor's youth council, you'll find that there's a there's a young man who is extremely intelligent, has contributed so much. Mm -hmm but his death. And, and we've made the initial investment to make sure that there's a translator uh, with him and when he attends events, when he attends activities, and especially when he's at meetings that someone's able to translate for him. We didn't, we didn't take his, his, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, disability you know, for granted. We actually welcomed it to hopefully make sure that there's a voice there now speaking for that population in, in the Mayor's Youth Council that never existed before. And just one final point on, on, on that issue. Um, students with special special needs or disabilities let's also consider some of them may not speak english as well or, or their mm -hmm. parents may not speak english as well so more can be done to help those students as well and their parents get their parents more involved in any type of programming um, i think that's also critical so you don't have to give me an answer now but that's something i i do want to focus on i have asked the sure. BPS about it. Mm -hmm. um, if you are able to develop a partnership down the road with BPS, uh, I know it'd help a lot of families across the city. Thank you. Thank Noted. you. Thank you, Councilor. Does anyone else have additional questions before we go? Councilor Presley. Thank you. Um, when I asked earlier about which uh, centers had the highest performing, the lowest performing foot traffic, um, I believe one of the lower performing ones you cited was Roslindale, and I'm just curious, uh, given the concentration of, of immigrants in that community, I mean, certainly throughout the whole city, but I just wonder in light of what's happening nationally, are there any partnerships or um, perhaps with the Office of, um, of Immigrant Advancement or community-based mm -hmm. organizations, are the centers being used to, um, for Know Your Rights trainings or uh, Immigrant Defense mm -hmm. Fund, or is that something maybe that could be used in Roslindale to incentivize more foot traffic since there's right. so much fear and misinformation? Yeah, um, the Menino Center, is a, it, it's a, a unique center in that where, where it's located, um, it, it tends to draw from the, 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 the housing development that it sits in close proximity to. We have another community center that is similar to that, which is the Gallivan Community Center. And I think that's one of the, the challenges in terms of the foot traffic, when you look at the, the, the numbers. Um, it's, it's not that it doesn't get utilized. The, the folks in the community use it quite, sure, quite yeah. a bit, but it's just that it, it's not the place that people tend to get drawn to outside of the, the housing development. And so we, we have to do a better job of engaging 
around that area. Um, and also, you know, uh, the, you know, the Rosendale Community Center is in close proximity. So I think that tends to draw a lot more of the surrounding community than the Menino Center, just because of the proximity. But um, we certainly would love to partner with some of the, um, the other external. Or just external. for the system as a whole, not even for those that are underperforming since they are so accessible and the Office of Immigrant Advancement and so many of our community-based organizations from Central Presente to MIRA, um, you know, uh, ACL, so many people have been doing uh, these workshops. Um, but I just wonder, given the, uh, the accessibility of the centers, if, if they could be a, a physical Absolutely. resource in that way. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. In fact, um, Chief Martinez has challenged us on that okay. um, to, to really um, better engage the other um, OHHS um, departments. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any more? I don't. I'm all set. Great. Thank you. Um, we have. Uh, let me call someone up that wishes to uh, publicly testify. Michael Kozu. Thank you, uh, uh, council members, uh, BCY staff. On behalf of Project Right, I thank you for providing this opportunity to address the Boston Centers for Youth and Families FY19 budget. We appreciate the work that the Grove Hall Community Center has been providing in senior services, and we understand the limitations of the available facilities. At the same time, we think it's extremely doable for the Grove Hall Community Center to also provide youth programming from 9, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., Mondays through Fridays, and they should also consider providing youth programming on Saturdays. Being a shared site with the Burke High School does, does provide logistical uh, sketching issues, but those issues can be worked out rather than not providing any direct youth programming out of city or school facilities in the Grove Hall neighborhood, which has one of the highest populations of young people for any Boston neighborhoods. The city council should also raise with the Boston Public Schools the issue of facilities management taking control of the Burke and Frederick gym schedules in the evening so that th their administrations have no control on who uses their gym. In fact, they have to negotiate with outside entities if they have a school function in the evening so they can use their own space. I would like to remind the City Council the 12-year campaign to renovate the Jeremiah Burke High School and the 10-year campaign to site, design, and construct and implement the Little Frederick Middle School as a pilot school was intentionally done to open up these facilities either as a community center like the Burke or the neighborhood-based uh, school with access to up-to-date facilities, the Frederick, to compensate for the lack of multi-purpose city facilities in the Grove Hall neighborhood. What I want to also do, I'm glad I was able to sit through this hearing, is that I would like to also propose, which is not in my written statements, which I will add into it, that um, the City Council should propose a st um, study to look at a standalone facility or additional facilities in the Grove Hall uh, community to address the, the lack of a standalone site in, in the uh, Grove Hall neighborhood for a BCYF facility. One of the things that was talked about earlier is that um, some of you are aware that we had issues with facility management kind of blocking us. For, for we've had ever since um, um, the community center transitioned to a, a strictly a senior center, uh, pretty good access to the Berg Gym and working with the Grove Hall Community Center staff. But then um, this past April, after you know, we always wait after the basketball seasons to kind of. Uh, reserve and follow through just given the you don't know about the playoff schedules and the basketball league schedules and the, and the weather issues that come up during that season. So when we tried to apply for um, this April, uh, we were turned down initially because uh, a number of the AU teams had scheduled it out and was kind of in, in essence then kind of blocked out neighborhood uh, ch uh, youth from having access to the Burke or the Grove Hall Community Center gym. So we had a uh, kind of fight about it. We had to raise a stink about it. Um, and, but hopefully between BCYF and Boston School Facilities and, and the school department, uh, the city can work out an arrangement where in areas where there is no standalone uh, Boston Centers for Youth and Family sites, that there is granted some neighborhood access to the Frederick and to the Burke for those gyms because otherwise we have thousands of young people that really have no immediate access to gyms in, in their facilities. One of the things that we were asking that the uh, city council come up with is to look for, is there a, perhaps a budget amendment that can perhaps help to supplement the Grove Hall Community Center staff so that we can perhaps have youth programming from five to nine and Saturday uh, on weekdays and um, uh, Saturday programming 
uh, out of the uh, Burke or the Grove Hall Community Center. Our project ride st um, budget is way too small to really fulfill that. Um, plus, um, due to uh, state delays in our uh, reimbursements, uh, we've had issues, but you know, we, we try to do, and we will certainly work with the Grove Hall Community C uh, Center and BCYF to continue um, doing it. And we've actually had a very successful Mike Nunnell Basketball League kickoff, and we're looking forward to continuing work with both the street workers and BCYF uh, staff in terms of this. The other thing we want to note is that Youth Development Fund really came out of a visit that uh, Councilor Campbell was at one of our community meetings, and she saw the number of young people that are going upstairs um, to uh, the gym at, at the same time we were having a community meeting. So there are things that perhaps can be done if we can kind of work together to address to kind of follow through in terms of that. But again, um, I, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to sit through the hearing. I do want to push for the idea about perhaps doing a, a study on is there a standalone site possible within uh, the Grove Hall neighborhood, just given the population? Um, the other thing is that we do have a site that we are looking at that is currently in transition from D&D to parks. Uh, the proposal was to uh, do a mini multi-purpose field on Geneva Ave across from the uh, Burke, just because the issues that the Burke has in terms of many times I would see the young people waiting for the school buses uh, to take them to um, uh, Ronan Park for football or to Ceylon Field for soccer, and the buses are always late, and they're just standing there, sitting there on the steps of the Burke trying to wait for the bus. And we, we thought that the solution was to create a, multi, a mini multi purpose field across the street. So at least then, rather than wait for the bus, they can at least get some skills development or some workshops or some practices in uh, uh, for the work. But perhaps. And I, I, I really don't want to take away from that, but perhaps that is the site, or maybe there are some other sites. I know the city's been pretty aggressive about disposing of the, a lot of the vacant land in Grove Fall. Perhaps that's the site that we can look at for additional uh, uh, BCY facilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that concludes uh, the BCYF portion of today's uh, hearing. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner, deputies and all, all of your team out in the gallery. I want to thank you all for what you do every day and especially for all the staff out in the field that uh, we have scattered throughout the city. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs> Counselor. Today is Monday, May 14th. Uh, we are here regarding revolving fund for City Hall Child Care, docket 0577, message in order authorizing a limit for the Boston Centers for Youth and Family revolving fund for fiscal year 2019 to pay salaries and benefits of employees and to purchase supplies and equipment necessary to operate the City Hall Child Care Program. This revolving fund shall um, be directed with any and all receipts from tuition paid by parents or guardians for children enrolled in the center. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $750,000. Um, I'd like to again welcome uh, our friends from Boston Centers for Youth and Families. I am joined by my colleague and friend from South Boston, Councilor Ed Flynn, and I'll <coughs> let you uh, make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Seal. I'm going to actually defer to my Deputy Commissioner of Administration and Finance, Mike, who actually uh, manages this uh, for BCYF to actually share and elaborate more on. Okay. Um, thank you. So this is pretty straightforward. It's, it's the revolving fund that's used to administer the City Hall child care program that takes place here at City Hall. Um, it's a uh, toddler and um, infant toddler and preschool program. Uh, and it is, you, it, we do operate it through a revolving fund, which we use to fund the program, being staff salaries and benefits and, and what the whatnot. Um, we've really been, this program does historically operate at a deficit. Um, the, you know, cost of running a child care program is pretty costly, and we also keep the rates uh, very affordable, well below market rate, um, you know, uh, to offer this this program to, to the constituents. So it does run um, a deficit. We've been administering 5% increases on the tuition yearly, which we're ready to implement another one this month. 
to help try to close the deficit a little bit. Um, but the $750,000 uh, authorization that we're requesting will help fund, uh, again, the tuitions collected will go out and um, pay for the staff and different expenses associated with the child care program. But again, historically, this program does does run at a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, so most likely, uh, you know, the program will cost uh, additional funds that, that um, we work to uh, resolve through the use of other available funds at the end of the fiscal year. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, and uh, as we discussed prior to gaveling in, um, there's a, a, an appropriation of about $1.3 million um, up significantly from last year, and you just explained it, so that's basically to plug a hole in, in any deficits. How many uh, children do we serve in the uh, child care program? I believe it's around, um, I believe it's around 50 children. There's 17 infant slots, 12 toddler slots, and 25 preschool slots. Okay. So it's around 50. 50. And for the most part, uh, how many, how many uh, employees uh, work in the child care? So I know that there's one, um, there's one obviously a director, and then I want to say we actually have a current um, vacancy now that we just have posted. Uh, I want to say they have six or seven teachers. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the number they have. Obviously, all this is all based on the ratios um, with regards to EEC licensing and things like that. So right. I'm pretty sure it's right around seven or eight, um, including the director. Okay. And lastly, um, do you have a waiting waiting list? Yes. There's the, the <laughs> pretty regularly run a waiting list. Um, the real demand for the program is with the infants, because uh, right. infant child care can be very expensive, and infant child care is not something you know that you can find pretty readily. So we do have a wait list, um, but we're we, ha we try to maintain that wait list as best as possible depending on, you know, depending on staffing. If there's a vacancy uh, in the staffing, we obviously can't accommodate as many children, so sometimes the wait list gets held up a little bit to mm -hmm. help us kind of regroup and, and, and get all of our staff on board before we pull from the wait list. But we've worked really hard to develop a wait list policy to make sure everyone's clear around how we select children when there's a vacancy arises. And, right. Um, we really try to pull from that list as much as we can and keep it as short as possible, but we always have a wait list. There just isn't right. enough slots to right. go around. Great. Um, Councilor Flynn, do you have any questions? I just have a quick comment. Sure. Uh, the City of Boston Child Care Program is excellent. Great staff, um, great programming, and it's a great addition to the city and to working parents across the city. So I just want to say thank you to the staff that are doing an excellent job. Right. Let, let me second that, and Councilor Savitrui. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, no, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Great. Um, that concludes the revolving fund um, docket 0577. That hearing is adjourned. <laughs>